Welcome uh, everybody to this uh, uh, third uh, installment of our cycle of uh, conferences that we are organizing in the Czech Republic uh, during the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. This is our third conference and today it is devoted to a very topical subject matter. We are going to discuss health. We are going to discuss health challenges in a post-COVID-19 world in the context of a series of conferences about Europe after the pandemic. So thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. Let me start by thanking our partner organizations First and foremost, the European Commission. I am uh, speaking to you from the premises of the European Commission representation in Prague, in the Czech Republic. The European Commission has been throughout our main partner and uh, uh, it will remain uh, for the uh, rest, for the last uh, four conferences that will uh, succeed the conference that is uh, taking place uh, now. We have uh, other very important partners. I will mention uh, all of them in detail when the thank you greeting note uh, will be uh, due in our agenda for the day. Uh, let me give now the floor for the opening remarks of this first part of our conversation to the uh, Vice President of the European uh, Investment Bank, uh, Ms. Liliana Pavlova. Uh, she is not only an outstanding uh, supporter of our cycle of conferences and our, of our joint endeavors, the uh, Embassy of Portugal in Prague, uh, Euro um, European Investment Bank office in the Czech Republic, but uh, she already participated with us in other conferences of our cycle, uh, namely the Conference on the Climate and Digital Transitions. Uh, she is very well known. Uh, she is uh, nominated by the Bulgarian government to be vice president of the European Investment uh, Bank. And uh, she is the, the first woman uh, representing the, uh, in the European Investment Bank as a member of its Presidency Council. So, with uh, uh, no further ado, uh, Madame Pavlova, it is a pleasure to see you again. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador Sampaio. Thank you very much personally to you uh, for your and the Portuguese presidency for your really uh, proactive, uh, proactive uh, role and uh, dedication and really hosting so, so many different events with, uh, with the great support of this representation. Dear ministers, uh, dear deputy ministers, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, uh, I'm really very, very pleased uh, to be today with you. However, I, I wished uh, I could be in the beautiful Prague in person with you, but unfortunately, this is, uh, this is the reality. We are living in unprecedented times which are still being the case after more than a year of the pandemics in, uh, uh, since the pandemics hit uh, Europe. But I really hope uh, that, that soon we will be able uh, to, to restart our, our physical meetings and gatherings as well. The spread of the virus is, um, is still taking its toll on people around the world. In terms of uh, rising debts, as well as limited freedom with social distancing and national lockdowns, we witness the economic sentiment and observe that expectations are picking up Europe, as well as the new vaccines are being approved, which provide protection against severe COVID-19 cases, including protection against regional mutations. Although new cases of COVID-19 globally have fallen by 50% since the beginning of this year, with the largest declines in case numbers in countries that were worst hit at the end of last year, including US, UK, South Africa, and Portugal as well. However, 
data for Central and Eastern Europe suggest the region is moving towards a third wave of infection. Uh, the goal of today is to stop the pandemic, which we can effectively do by deploying a preventive vaccine against the coronavirus. Nevertheless, it is equally important to support potential treatment options, as well as reliable, fast and easy diagnostics. The AB was one of the first institutions to finance BioNTech R&D program because we knew BioNTech from an earlier investment in cancer research and understood how valuable their technology can be for fighting COVID-19. It is crucial to understand that the EAB has deliberately invested or, is it, or it, we are in a late stage due diligence uh, in portfolio of vaccines to cover a variety of technologies. We wanted to make sure that uh, a variety of vaccines covering different requirements would be available. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, the EAB has responded by supporting a promising portfolio of COVID-19 solutions beyond already mentioned BioNTech. We supported different treatment options ranging from antibodies, small molecules, to cell therapy. And finally, yet uh, important, importantly, we financed projects increasing diagnostic capacity, both inside EU and outside EU. As the approval of the first vaccine shown, it takes time to roll out vaccination campaigns and increase manufacturing capacity to satisfy the, the existing demand. Hence, the EAB already included in the supported projects with potential vaccine suppliers an increase in the manufacturing capacity in order to address the potential demand. In addition, we have also supported in the past important steps in the value chain, such as fill and finish facilities, which appear to be the bottleneck in Europe. For these reasons, after the extremely positive results achieved in 2020, the bank services are continuing to engage with players in the life science sector, aiming to support additional European manufacturing capacity, both in treatments and in vaccines. Europe needs to be able to ensure sufficient access to essential medical goods for all its citizens, at any given time. The EAB, the European Bank, has been investing an average of between 2 to 3 billion euro per year in the health sector and has built considerable expertise and a wide network doing so. We have a team of medical and pharmaceutical experts health economists and engineers to identify and validate projects and to offer advice to them. This expertise paid off during the COVID-19 pandemic. The AB was quickly able to identify promising research projects and invest in interesting companies to finance in order to tackle, to help tackle the pandemic. Uh, some uh, from, from the latest examples we have here, I would like to highlight a few. Already I mentioned our 100 uh, million investment uh, in debt financing agreement with BioNTech, another 75 million euro loan agreement with CureVac to support companies ongoing development of vaccines against infection diseases, including the vaccine candidate for COVID-19. Uh, as well as 50 million euro investment in the biomedical company uh, Pluris team to develop therapies for COVID-19 and other unmet medical needs, and another 10 million euro to Scope Flu Fluidics, a Polish medical technology company developing innovative products in the field of diagnostics equipment for infection diseases. Coming closer to the region in the Czech Republic, last year we supported two regions, Pardubice and Central Bohemia region, to improve healthcare capacities while investing in their hospitals infrastructure upgrade. At the same time, we have put in place the Central European COVID facility worth 1 billion euro, supporting countries in the region 
to cover their public spending related to COVID-19 response. In Portugal, among other operations, we have recently approved our financing for the Madeira Central Hospital to finance the new infrastructure and related services to improve the overall health strategy in the region of Madeira. Now, uh, I would like to also to, 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 to emphasize uh, the, our support uh, uh, of the healthcare investment overall. Already well before COVID crisis, we knew how essential are healthcare investments for our future. In addition, healthcare plays an important, important role in the EU economy, accounting for 8% of the total workforce and for 10% of its GDP. As the EU Bank, we support healthcare projects that aim to ensure universal access to high quality and affordable services. What is the EAB group providing for the healthcare is truly remarkable. I'm very glad that you will have the opportunity to learn during the second panel of this event even more on what we can deliver when it comes to financing and also to advisory uh, services for the healthcare industry. My colleagues, Felicitas Radel, head of the team of health experts in the bank, together with Natalie Binet, who is heading the PRAC office of the EIB, will walk you through on how our bank and the group is deploying support for the health projects eligible for financing, which uh, includes investments into hospitals, healthcare delivery infrastructure, medical research, education and training, health informatics and innovation, or the integrated and people-centered approach to healthcare networks, especially involving cross-border cooperation. In other words, EAB covers the entire value chain from ensuring that promising ideas will end up in innovative products, increasing the quality of life of European citizens, to ensuring construction of state-of-the-art healthcare facilities, deploying innovative health delivery approaches. Ladies and gentlemen, let's bear in mind that access to health should be universal. Health should be effective, safe, and affordable. These are the main tenets of the EAB's approach to this sector. Through its work, the EAB contributes to reducing healthcare inequalities and social exclusion, particularly by supporting underserved and sparsely populated regions. And my wish today is that this would be especially the case also when tackling the COVID crisis. The EAB is committed to continue being the efficient when ensuring and supporting we have autonomous independence while not only fighting with this pandemic, but also accessing modern, sustainable healthcare services. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all fruitful and interesting discussion and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Vice President, for your opening remarks. And uh, indeed, as you just said, the participation of the EIB during this conference uh, will not only be uh, your uh, opening remarks, that again, we thank you very much for, but also the full-fledged participation during the second panel of our conference that will deal exactly with strategic investments in health infrastructure and innovations in the health industry, where uh, the EIB is really one of the uh, global uh, major uh, uh, players. So thank you very much for that. We are going to have, again, during the second panel, not only the participation of uh, Natalie Binet that is going to moderate, and she is the head of your office here in the Czech Republic, but also, as you pointed out, the uh, head of your uh, life science and health division, uh, Ms. Felicitas uh, Riedel. Now, uh, let me uh, give the floor uh, to uh, the representative of the European uh, Commission, 
John Ryan e da Director for Public Health uh, at the DG Santé in the European Commission. Uh, and you will also uh, participate, you will also be with us throughout the conference, participating again in the first panel, the one that will deal with broader health challenges in the post-COVID COVID world. So, uh, John Ryan, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, Ambassador. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished uh, guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the European Commission, I'd like to say a few words in respect of the current uh, COVID outbreak and also the future perspectives. The COVID pandemic has been, of course, a major wake-up call for the European Union. We have been in the past familiar with dealing with more localized outbreaks or outbreaks limited to specific populations or outbreaks indeed taking place outside Europe. We can think of recent examples like the measles outbreak in Europe, but then the Ebola outbreak, which is ongoing in Central Africa, and the Zika outbreak. But the uh, difference is that this COVID uh, pandemic is truly global in nature. And second difference is that it has hit the European Union in a very strong way. Uh, globally, uh, since the end of December 2019, and up until last week, we had 114 million cases of COVID reported globally, including two and a half million deaths. In the European Union, 22 million, 22 and a half million uh, cases have been reported to date, and about a half a million, or just over a half a million deaths in the European Union. So we're not talking about a negligible outbreak, particularly uh, given all the other impacts that it's had on society and on our uh, economies. We've seen from the start of the outbreak the great impact of the COVID infection on our health systems, and I'm very happy to see that your conference today is focusing on the challenges to our infrastructure and innovations in our health system. You will remember uh, last year the problems that everybody was having in obtaining gloves, masks, ventilators and robes uh, in the first few months of the outbreak. And then, of course, the shortages with essential medicines. And lastly, we saw the rush to find supplies of uh, therapeutic products and testing kits. And of course, the advanced purchase agreement and supply our vaccines for our population, which I'll talk about in a moment. Let me recall for everybody listening that the European Union Treaty provides that the organization and delivery of healthcare is a member state responsibility. It's black and white in the treaty. Nevertheless, we have legislation in place on cross-border health threats, uh, which I'll speak about in the first panel. This allows us to operate a rapid alert system, to develop common risk assessments, and to coordinate measures, as well as to organize this joint procurement of uh, medical countermeasures, which I mentioned. In both the examples I gave just now, the question of shortages of materials and medicines and the legal framework, we've seen the European Union working together in an unprecedented manner. Joint procurement of uh, materials and medicines was organized, and the European Union budget was used to directly purchase products which were offered then to the member states. This is ongoing today. We're offering large quantities of antigen tests as I speak uh, to, the, to the member states. And of course, the EU decided for the first time to act together to purchase the vaccines. Just to mention this latter point, the Commission has proposed to the member states that they should aim to reach a target of 80% vaccination for people over 80 and 80% 80 of healthcare workers to be vaccinated by the end of this month, by the end of March. We also propose that there should be a general target of 70% of the population vaccinated by the summer. Now we have negotiated supplies of vaccine and we've uh, signed uh, on behalf of the European Union purchase orders for three of the authorized vaccines, and we have contracts in place for three more, uh, assuming that they will be authorized in due course. 
This is for a total amount of 2.6 billion doses. So you can see that we have substantial additional supply, which we also intend to use for donations and sales to third countries. To date, 52 million doses have been delivered, uh, and 38 of those, 38 million of those, have been actually administered to citizens, which amounts to about just over 7% of the EU population have, having received their first dose so far. A complicating factor, which was mentioned by my colleague from the bank, is the circulating variants or mutations of the virus, which have had effect on the transmissibility of the virus and also on the efficacy of the vaccines. The Commission most recently launched an initiative to increase vaccine sequencing. In other words, trying to pick up the actual strain of the virus, which is concerned in positive cases. And to help with the development and production of adapted va vaccines to respond to these new uh, variants. Impacts of COVID are not limited to the direct effects. We've also seen spikes in mental health events, also in the health, prof in the health professional community. And we've seen substantial delays in, in cancer screening and development of treatments and, and delivery of treatments for, for things like cardiovascular disease. The efforts to increase resilience of our health systems is something I'll speak about in the first panel. And of course, the measures taken to reduce transmission are those which have affected our society and our economies the most as we seek to protect our health through lockdowns and transport restrictions. Here again, the European Union has sought to coordinate the member states and we continue to do so. For example, with our forthcoming initiative on vaccine certification. I will finally mention the support of the EU budget to help countries deal with the current outbreak and to rebuild it when it has been contained. The EU's long-term budget coupled with Next Generation EU, a temporary instrument designed to boost the recovery, will be the largest stimulus package ever financed through the EU budget. A total of 1.8 trillion euros uh, will help to rebuild a post-COVID Europe, a specific health program and research program with substantial resources have also been agreed. And we're in the process now of trying to define the priority actions for financing to rebuild and strengthen our health systems and prevent the next pandemic threat. The topic of today's conference is therefore of high political, social, economic and health importance. I'm grateful to the Portuguese Presidency and to the other partners involved for launching this reflection. And I'd be, of course, very happy to listen and discuss as the conference continues. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, uh, for those opening remarks and looking forward to uh, your participation um, at uh, uh, panel one that will uh, uh, take place immediately after the uh, keynote conversation segment we are now uh, we are now uh, going to open uh, let me uh, say uh, that uh, i uh, need to recognize two other partners of ours uh, that are accompanying uh, us uh, in this uh, conference uh, the um, uh, prague based uh, uh, Institute uh, uh, of International Relations, and also another prominent uh, uh, Czech uh, think tank, the European. So they are also with us today, and thank you very much also to uh, both those organizations for their support and participation. Now uh, we are entering the keynote conversation. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the very high level distinguished uh, guests of ours uh, this uh, this afternoon uh, let me uh, start uh, by uh, saying that we are going to have the uh, czech uh, republic uh, deputy uh, minister of health uh, elena regnerova that is here with us today uh, representing uh, the minister of health and representing the uh, uh, czech government we have also uh, with us today uh, Maria de Belém Roseira, 
uh, very well known uh, internationally and uh, uh, nationally in Portugal nationality. Uh, Maria de Belém Roseira was a, a Minister of uh, Health. Uh, she is a long-standing political uh, personality in my country. Uh, she was recently a candidate to uh, president of the Portuguese uh, Republic. And so, uh, uh, Maria de Belém Roseira, it is a great pleasure and an honor for me uh, to have you with us uh, today. We have also uh, Professor Adalberto uh, Campos Fernandes. Uh, he is uh, uh, not only one of the uh, former ministers of health of Portugal, she wa he was the immediate predecessor of the incumbent uh, Portuguese Minister of Health, but uh, is also administrator, administrator of several entities and institutions in the health uh, sector and member of the board of INODIS, the uh, Association of uh, Innovation and Development in uh, Health. So we have a full-fledged uh, panel of uh, participants. Uh, we are going to give them the floor and then to try to discuss uh, with them the main issues at stake when we discuss health challenges in a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, let me also tell you that the Portuguese uh, Minister of uh, Health will be represented by uh, a Deputy Minister, Mr. Diogo Serras Lopes, that is going to join us uh, in time on time for the first uh, panel discussion. Now, uh, giving the floor to the uh, keynote speakers, uh, let me tell you uh, from my own in a, in a very brief uh, uh, couple of sentences that we need to realize that the global pandemic has been a looming risk for decades. So one of the first reflections uh, would be, of course, to try to understand why we were not better prepared. Then, uh, of course, we know that we are living through extraordinary challenges and un uncertainties. Uh, but leaders, uh, our leaders, uh, of course, they are under uh, great pressure to, to make decisions, uh, to uh, managing the immediate impact of the pandemic and its consequences. And so the decisions will shape the state of the world for, for years to, to come. But uh, the world has already managed extreme conditions before. And um, uh, if I could uh, try to learn something from those extreme conditions, I would say that leaders have in front of them essentially three tasks. The first is to fight our common enemy together to fight the pandemic. And then the second one is uh, really to try to anticipate the political and geopolitical consequences of the pandemic. And the third task is the economic reconstruction that has to deal with the, the government debts accumulated exactly because of the pandemic and uh, a global trading and investment system uh, that is uh, under great strain. So with those very brief initial remarks from my side, in order to try also to uh, make a contribution uh, to uh, your conversation, your debate that I will uh, moderate, let me give the floor, uh, first of all, to uh, the uh, Czech uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Health, uh, Elena uh, Regnorova, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, dear Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to apologize uh, our minister, Mr. Blatney, uh, because for the moment he has to be in the parliament and he is very sorry not to be here with you. And so I am here instead of him and I, I try my best to continue discussion and uh, I would like to start. So. First of all, I would like to thank you for having the opportunity to participate in this video conference. 
Furthermore, on behalf of the Czech uh, Ministry of Health, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to your work concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. And indeed, I would like to thank you for your presence today to discuss these issues, which I consider very important, not only because of the current situation in the Czech Republic, and uh, we know that it is not uh, very nice. Uh, we have very, very uh, much problems in the moment. And uh, uh, it is uh, very important, uh, uh, but also of your willingness to identify effective solutions that can help us to overcome future public health crises. The COVID-19 pandemic represents an unprecedented and unparalleled health crisis on the global scale. And in this regard, I would like to highlight the cooperation and solidarity among all EU member states and the European Commission, which we see as crucial especially for the future improvement of sustainable health systems in the EU. I would like also to support the work of ECDC, which helps states increase their sequencing capacity. And last but not least, especially the work of and its rolling review process for ensuring swift, but still mainly safe vaccine authorization process procedure. For this moment, for this reason, I would like to support all EU member states with their effort to find an effective response to the pandemic. And I also greatly appreciate their hard work in order to moderate risks of COVID-19, which include data and experience sharing, monitoring mechanisms, increasing testing capacity, or motivating citizens to comply with the non-pharmaceutical measures that are essential steps for coping with the current situation because the resilience of health systems has in some instances turned out to be the weak link in the response to the crisis. It, it also has to be emphasized that the mayor key to mitigating the current situation are vaccination rollout plans. The ability of the Czech Republic to meet our vaccination goals will highly depend on the stability of the distribution chain. Same as probably all member states, the Czech Republic considers the reduction and hoc changes and ad hoc changes in deliveries as a burning issue of vaccine rollout. The rollout is also ne negatively affected. Uh, by disinformation campaigns. Moreover, we consider important to examine the impact of new variants on vaccine effectiveness. In this context, the Czech Republic is going to support all efforts in order to ensure and distribute safe vaccines to all of our citizens. Regarding health challenges in a post-COVID-19 world, it will be necessary to improve the support to health workers, healthcare systems, supply chain logistics, investment in research, and more importantly, in prevention activities. I would like to emphasize that these issues must be coordinated, not just at the EU level, but also globally. The pandemic has hit the whole world, and for this reason, the future development must be orchestrated with a deep focus on a global solidarity, multilateralism, and international cooperation in order to build resilient health systems and achieve a global health security. It will be necessary to focus on several tasks particularly on applicating innovative approaches in medicine, providing of vaccines for all, building stronger mechanisms in early warning systems and prevention, or securing sufficient funds for medical science and new technologies. As a result of all these measures combined with Shell Hope, see better responsiveness, responsiveness of services related to public health threats. 
in connection with the above, the Czech Republic is trying to support investments aimed precisely at increasing the resilience of healthcare system, including increasing the availability of healthcare workers. The Czech Republic is aware of the need to strengthen the healthcare system, especially in the area of infrastructure. And for this reason, it very much welcomes the possibilities of new investment instruments by the European Union, such, such as the REACT EU and the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Especially in the case of REACT EU, the Czech Republic has decided to devote more than 70% of the total allocation for the Czech Republic to healthcare support. Dear colleagues, let me conclude by expressing my thanks once more for your fruitful cooperation concerning all COVID-19 issues we are facing right now. I do hope that our work will continue and that the most difficult phase of this pandemic will be over soon. Especially thanks to adopting effective, effective tools and measures that will help us to find a way out of this crisis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister, for your, for your remarks. We will come back to some of the issues that you touched upon during your intervention. Thank you very much. Let me now give the floor to Maria de Rosaira. Please, you have the floor, and thank you very much again for your participation. No, I have the sound. Now you can hear me. I was thanking and uh, saying that I'm very honored uh, with the invitation to participate in this conference, in this event. Uh, and I thank especially Mr. Ambassador, uh, always very active and uh, with the, a very specific feeling of the opportunity of the, the the things you put on the floor to discuss. And I agree to all the distinguished participants. I have prepared a little presentation. I think uh, uh, I can ask you to put it on the screen um, because it's better to control uh, the schedule. And I'm going to, Me and I to, that. to pass yes, immediately to the second. It I is, don't know if is. I can command that. I'm trying, but I cannot. So I'm asking Giovanna or someone else uh, to put immediately the, the next slide. Thank you. Um, according to the special Eurobarometer on social issues, published uh, last week, uh, more than one third of respondents prioritize healthcare and more than 25% uh, considers uh, social protection a key element of social Europe. Next slide, please. Even when we consider economic and social, social development issues, social and healthcare concerns are at the top of the list. These results underline the political relevance of health and uh, the, the fact that uh, it cannot be ignored by politicians and political parties. Uh, people need politicians uh, to be aware of the importance of these issues for them. Next slide, please. But it is important to talk uh, about the future uh, to know uh, what was left behind, the collateral damage of COVID-19 in numbers. And as you see, um, numbers year on year, 2019 to 2020, 
millions of procedures were left behind and thousands of those include screenings of oncological diseases of main concern. If you look at the number of surgeries not performed, it may seem small. However, we must consider the reflect the effect of the smashing decrease of in-person in procedures in primary and hospital care as well as medical exams. If you don't can make the di diagnosis, you cannot order uh, the, the surgery. Next slide, please. I prepared this slide to put uh, what was left behind in perspective. Uh, and uh, comparing them to what nor normal numbers should look like. I underline uh, in, the, in this corner, the, the right uh, corner of the slide, uh, that uh, um, 5,000 people awaiting are awaiting cancer surgery. They have been diagnosed, but uh, they are in waiting lists. Many more could have been diagnosed if they had had access to healthcare procedures and medical exams. The only positive uh, achievement was with medical appointments at a distance. Uh, nevertheless, not all, pr all procedures, as we know, can be replaced by new technologies. The other slide, please. As you can read in this slide, even with 85.5 million appointments at a distance, 25 million less procedures were performed. And this is a burden we, we have to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are leaving the very negative social and economic effects of uh, the pandemic, as we know. Decrease of GDP, the growth of unemployment, the burden in healthcare, uh, special mental health, as you know, as we know. And uh, that's why we have to finally embrace the notion expressed by Ralph Hammerson in the 19th century. Health is wealth. The pandemic taught us that in the worst, taught us that in the worst possible way. Uh, this is true for each one of us, as well as the economy and society as a whole. And this is why health has to be seen as an investment and not as a cost. As some of us were saying, uh, long lasting and only a few believed it. And the, Finance ministers were very reluctant uh, to accept this. Now they have to change and they have changes, changed, I hope. And the support to this conference of European Investment Bank and the speech we had just here is important to emphasize this shift. We have to heal the wants. And uh, to heal the wants with a new cooperative vision, to look at our national health system and to our national system of health. Um, to, we have to join forces with all the available resources, public, social, and private without prejudice, but promoting transparency and being accountable to make sure we recover and work as well. Uh, and there's a well-oiled machine in the future. We have to put people in the center of our concerns and offer new models of care, integrated ones and people-centered health services, keeping together and not apart. We must put the most vulnerable ahead and consider the determinants of poor health, adopting, adopting a health in all policies approach. 
and prepare uh, the path to arrive where we want to be through a strategic vision to look to the future, to deal with the threats ahead, to look at the needs of people and to be uh, to, to, to offer best models and basis to serve them. Keeping in mind the importance of research, of knowledge in health, we discovered with the need of, ex of the vaccines how we need uh, to emphasize the importance of research and the new cooperative vision. We need to look at human resources and in the healthcare and understand that this is a long lasting process. We need new leadership in our health institutions, meritocracy instead of party aligned denominations. And in health policy, we have, we have to prioritize prevention, to put prevention first, to reduce non-communicable diseases, work on mental health support, uh, incorporate digitalization in all its potential as a fundamental tool. It's not an end on, on, in itself. It's a tool to serve people uh, across all platforms and even cross borders, namely European countries, and strengthening the EU's role as described in EU for Health program. Next slide, please. Keeping in mind the correlating between poverty in health and health. Uh, what uh, some uh, people uh, call the poverty trap. Um, the correlating between poverty and health and the huge social and economic impact of COVID-19. We must work together to recover from it. A uh, cooperative vision, collaborative intelligence approach, because we need all and we need to be each one another and not bet on division. Next slide, please. To sum up, social justice, inclusion, and sustainable development need a great reset. This is a sentence um, used in the last uh, World Economic Forum conference, and I very much agree on it. We have to understand that health care systems are very important tools uh, to fight for equity, uh, to fight for uh, inclusion, uh, to fight uh, not to leave anyone behind. So to fight uh, to, to achieve the SDG goals because we need healthy people to have healthy economies and to have healthy societies. Thank you very much for your attention and keep healthy, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Maria de Mãe Rosera, for your remarkable intervention. Uh, if I, I will come to what you said during our uh, debate, uh, I will I will take immediately from what you said the the conclusion that uh, undoubtedly our world will be transformed by the pandemic we are living through. Uh, let's see if it will be transformed for the better or for, yes. or for the worse. But thank you, thank you very much for your remarks. Let my let me now give the floor to Professor Adalberto Campos Fernandes. It is a great personal pleasure to to have you here with us today. 
Uh, please, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, Ambassador. You are doing an excellent work promoting the, the Portuguese presidency and the, the Portuguese image in the Czech Republic and all over in Europe. I would like to greet also Deputy Minister Ewen Rogdenorova. Sorry for the difficulty to spell your name because it's not so easy. Vice President of the uh, EIB, uh, Mrs. Liliana Pavlova, and uh, our colleague uh, from Public Health, Dr. John Ryan, from the European Commission. Uh, I extend my greetings to all the colleagues and the members of the panel that are now following as well. We are now uh, running short of time, Ambassador, so I will try to, to speed up a little bit my intervention, and I, I, I would like to stress some um, key messages concerning the extraordinary presentation that my colleague and friend, Dr. Marit Bangosleira, just uh, presented us. And beginning with the, the expression of the World Economic Forum, when uh, they said that Europe and the world need a great reset. It's true, because uh, we are now living and entering in a new era. Either Europe, either the world are seeing new challenges and new opportunities to develop new policies. So probably the most important that uh, uh, challenge that we are facing now is to raise in Europe a new culture of uh, social cohesion, a new culture of uh, collaboration. I know, and Dr. John Ryan said it, that the treaties does not uh, uh, foreseen uh, by the moment the integration of uh, national health policies. But we have uh, a ground to, to do because uh, health policies and public health and uh, the preparation of Europe for new emergence diseases, for new risks in the near future, it's a political commitment for everybody. We cannot uh, taking health from our common policies. We cannot take the common responsibility to fight again uh, ignored and uncertain risks, saying that, that this is a national uh, competence. We saw with Italy at the beginning the risk of letting countries alone. We saw the risk of the shortage of uh, medicines and, and uh, medical products. We saw recently um, the difficulties of uh, dealing with the big pharma and the pharmaceutical industry all over the world. So my message is to build a new Europe based more in cooperation, collaboration, open borders, and bringing health inside the common policies. We must be together because small countries, poor countries need to be helped by big countries and rich countries. That is what uh, uh, has been done by Chancellor Angela Merkel in the last years, last few years. That is the idea and vision of the president of the European Commission, Van der Leyen. We now feel that it is possible to build another Europe, more centered in social policies and getting into social policies, also health policies. So, I, it is important to, to stress uh, the idea that Europe is a common space, it's a, a very important uh, geographic and geopolitical space, and it is necessary to talk with the, the other blocs, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, and, and China. But it is important also not to forget our responsibilities with the third world. And it is important to stress and to underline the importance of the European countries to implement and to reinforce the COVAX initiative that is promoted by, uh, uh, the, uh, with the support of the WHO the, uh, in, in recent, in recent uh, months. So, I am an optimistic and I would like to, to conclude with a note of optimism because I believe we start to learn really the lessons that we have uh, been exposed in the last year. As Marie Blaine Roseva said, now health ministers probably are more listened to in the ministers' councils. And now uh, probably in the European Commission, the idea to finance science, to finance investigation, to, fin to finance research, research and development, to invest in health 
is a new idea, an, an idea that brings progress, that brings development, that brings Europe to the mainstream of uh, its objectives, that is to build a, 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 a political area that thinks in the first place in people and uh, which the uh, with the idea that uh, nobody must be uh, left beyond. So thank you very much. And uh, I, I would like to, to, to underline your initiative. You are doing well, and this is a very interesting debate. And uh, I would like uh, to have the opportunity to see the other panels if I can. But uh, um, I would like, uh, and I, I am at your, at your disposal to, to answer to some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, let me uh, tell you that we uh, were just granted 15 additional minutes because we started also a little bit behind. Uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was really trying to help you because I, I was looking through the watch. And so I, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. But we have these 15 additional minutes that we are going to, to, to put to, to very good use. Let me try to ask you a, a global question that you can address the three of you in the way uh, you uh, would uh, feel uh, uh, better according not only to your interventions, but also uh, to your experiences and to the responsibilities that you have and the role that you hold uh, in, the, in the recent past. Uh, if uh, uh, I would uh, uh, take uh, uh, away from uh, the intervention of the uh, Czech Deputy Minister of Health, one of the main messages, I would say that uh, there are two balances that uh, uh, the Deputy Minister referred to that uh, are very challenging for someone with political and management health-related responsibilities. First of all, the balance between uh, full uh, self-sufficiency and uh, deeper interdependence. Uh, uh, the Deputy Minister mentioned those both those dimensions, uh, especially when it came to the development of vaccines, to the uh, development of uh, treatment uh, and the way uh, to not only overcome uh, the pandemic, uh, but also in a longer term perspective. Then the other balance that I would uh, extract from what uh, the Deputy Minister said is the balance between uh, efficiency and resilience. Uh, so this would be uh, the first part of my question, then I would really very much like to comment on what uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Maria de Blain Rosera said, uh, though our world is going and up with, to be transformed. The social dimension is key. Uh, the future that we are trying to build uh, in the wake of overcoming the pandemic uh, really means that uh, we uh, cannot afford to leave anyone behind. That was one of the strongest uh, messages encompassed uh, on uh, in a presentation. The, coll the collateral effects of the pandemic are staggering. Uh, we need really to address them again in a longer term uh, uh, perspective. I really very much, uh, very much like the way she put it, health is wealth. Uh, health is an investment, and that is also an essential ingredient for uh, decision makers and also for those that uh, have now uh, uh, topical political responsibilities. Part of the digital transition, uh, during our uh, previous conference, we discussed the digital transition and its social implications. There is also an education dimension. Uh, related into that, and that uh, was really a very important and powerful message. Poverty and health, uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, again, a very important uh, uh, part and parcel of our debate, and I will 
again mention that uh, when I will try to, to sum up. The Professor Campus uh, Fernandes, uh, the bigger role of the European Union, yes, of course, uh, and John Ryan also uh, referred a little bit to that during his opening remarks, how, how to achieve that in the best possible way. One of the priorities of the Portuguese presidency is exactly the implementation of the social pillar, uh, uh, the, the, the pillar of the social rights of the European Union. And in that context, the deepening of an European Union of health is, is, is what is at stake and also one of the key objectives of our time to implement uh, presidency of the European Union. Uh, you, you finished uh, with an optimistic message. Uh, I am very glad to hear that. Uh, that means that uh, uh, you uh, don't uh, doubt for a minute that we are going to see the light at the end of the tunnel and that we are going to be granted uh, and greeted with a better future when once the pandemic is over. So uh, these, these remarks of mine in a very concise and succinct way in order to prompt the debate and now it is up to you, the three of you, to comment on them and to say uh, whatever you deem appropriate in the context that I tried to, to describe. Please feel free. Uh, I'm not going to give the floor by the order I gave the floor on the first round. It is up to you to decide uh, amongst if, the three of you who should take the floor first. If you allow me, I would like for courtesy to let the, the closing of the session from the ladies' presence, so, uh, Minister Mir uh, and Minister uh, um, Elena. But um, I should emphasize that to you told uh, just in, in your summing up of the interventions. We need uh, another Europe. And uh, I am optimistic from one side because I, I believe that we are at the end of the pandemics, really. The, the pandemics is not uh, absolutely. Um, Eliminate. We, we have in the next uh, winter probably an endemic situation and an endemic uh, uh, infection, but we are in conditions now to promote the right, the right policies in terms of public health, in terms of general, generalizing the vaccine program. So it, it is the time to rebuild Europe in social and in sanitary uh, aspects. But it is also the time to consider that the, the social Europe is not only the, the Europe of the protection of employment and of work and of social rights. It is necessary to understand a union, a European Union of health. And you mentioned that it is not uh, necessary to keep in mind that the national competences in terms of health policies remain as they are. Naturally, the health system is, is, an, is a national competency, but we must have a common policy in terms of preparedness, in terms of alert, in terms of monitoring, because the world is a dangerous place. And uh, uh, it's also a, it's a, a, a dangerous place in, in terms of public risks and public health risks, but it is also a very unfair world and we must protect all the people, most vulnerable people and the, the fragile people uh, with common policies. So this is my, my, my message that the Portuguese presidency should take uh, advantage of this idea to have and um, strength the social pillar and the cohesion pillar in Europe, but keeping in mind that health must grow, health must be much more important in Europe than it is until now. And thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Um, and, and you were uh, really kind to leave the floor for the two ladies. And it is also a reminder that uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as of yesterday, we were celebrating the International Women's Day. Uh, so either uh, Mrs. Maria de Blair Rosaira or uh, uh, the Deputy Minister, to whom should I give the floor? The, Please, Mrs. Mayed Blank. You have to unmute Mrs. Mayed Blank, please. I'd yes. like to leave the, the last uh, intervention or comment to our deputy minister, our host, our host country. 
uh, to our Deputy Minister Elena. And I very much agree with uh, what uh, Professor Adalbert said. He's a doctor, I am a jurist, uh, so I understand that it, possi it is possible with uh, the treaties like they were approved uh, to have a stronger role to Europe in health through public health. And I think that this program, u for health uh, it's a very important one, and through it, Europe can do anything. And mainly, the most important things we need to do, according to the lessons the pandemic taught us. Because we only can face threats, uh, and nowadays, the threats of uh, communicable diseases are uh, worldwide. We only can face that with a very strong commitment inside the uh, European Union. And through that, and uh, through all the tools, the uh, European Union is uh, developing and aligning, uh, namely digital tools. I think it's very, very important that uh, um, European Union uh, could be in the front of the next need, the next political uh, visions uh, to face the future. We already knew the importance of uh, micro, uh, antimicrobial uh, biotical resistance, uh, and it was already a point uh, in the agenda of G7 and of uh, G20. But now we have uh, these new threats of uh, pandemics through virus, and we have to face that uh, in a, a, a broad agenda linked with uh, uh, the environment and uh, all uh, the, 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 the achievements we have uh, to make according to Paris Conference. And uh, this needs a very specific commitment of the European Union, and I am very, very confident on the strength of it and on uh, the um, uh, political force of uh, Ursula von der Leyen as a doctor, as a formal defense minister. She well understands the importance of that. And from a national point of view, we need to understand that the social impact of the pandemic, the social and economic impact of the, of the pandemic will be a long lasting problem. And we have to uh, face that uh, in a very intelligent way. And I think that uh, we have to, uh, to put collaborative intelligence ahead and uh, forget our differences and being uh, side by side in the really important things. And health is a very important thing because it supports the right of living and living a healthy life, not only for us, but for our descendants. And we know that very, very well. And that's why I emphasized the political importance of uh, of uh, of our political leaders to understand this and uh, to take uh, this agenda uh, in a very positive way. The other thing I'd like to say, if you allow me, is that uh, uh, health is a powerful tool to tackle with inequalities. And uh, the main uh, political problem we have now, it's the growing of inequalities during the pandemic uh, and we have to face that and to get health as a very important instrument, a very important tool uh, to tackle with this. And that's why, and again with European political agenda, uh, we, know, we need to put social indicators uh, as very important in European policy to do excess of structural funding, not only to achieve economic and financial 
uh, goals. We have to put social goals as something important to decide uh, to, uh, to the possibility of using uh, uh, structural funds, because structural funds are to promote uh, the, the social development of a country, because we don't have rich countries uh, with poor uh, social uh, achievements. So it's my main message, perhaps, that uh, we need to understand that and to act according to that. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insightful uh, answers and, uh, and comments. And we, uh, listening to you, we can uh, still hear uh, very alive the politician inside uh, yourself. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that. That really gave us the touch that we also uh, very much needed in uh, in our initial segment of our conference. And now for the final uh, comments and answers, the Deputy Minister of Health of the uh, Czech Republic. Please, Madame, the floor is yours. Elena, no, no, she's not there, she's down. Elena? Oh, okay, so give give me the floor. Uh, okay, she's there? No, okay. Thank you very much. I think that there is a problem of communication uh, for the final uh, comments and answers from the, uh, the Czech Republic Deputy Minister. Probably she will uh, join us in a couple of minutes. Let me, let me first of all, thank you very much for uh, your insightful uh, comments, presentations, and answers to the questions of the debate. Let me recognize the Portuguese uh, uh, State Secretary for uh, Health, uh, Mr. Diogo Serras Lopes. Uh, good afternoon. I am very glad that you uh, made it uh, on time uh, joining us in this, uh, in this uh, uh, part of our conference, knowing that you will full-fledgedly participate in the, in the first panel that will start in a couple of minutes. So thank you very much. Very glad to see you. Uh, now, uh, let me conclude this first panel with two uh, essential uh, remarks. Uh, one uh, that uh, follows very much in the footsteps of the comments made by the previous uh, speakers the uh, the the global responsibility the fact that we can uh, uh, never uh, leave anyone behind but that brings also care is also with it the collective and global moral sense of responsibility for each and every one of us uh, of course we need to fight the strong currents of uh, individualism that are still resisting the implementation of so basic things like social distancing or the universal use of, of masks. We are uh, uh, all in this together, as uh, Maria de Belen Rosera very well uh, put it. We are in uh, uh, all in this together, but some enjoy great advantages. And we need also to take that into account and we need that also to put that in, within the equation. But the responsibility for risk reduction falls on everyone. There's the importance of doing our best, each and every one of us, to cut down the chances of an outbreak. And then the smart choices that we are bound to, 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 to make. And one of the smart uh, choices is obviously the uh, universal use of masks. Uh, not doing that, uh, we will be part of a snowball effect. And we don't want to bear that moral responsibility. Our acts, our own acts, convey the right information. So with these more uh, let's say, psychological or social 
psychological remarks, uh, I would uh, end this uh, uh, first uh, segment of our conversation with a tribute to the medical doctors, both of Portugal and the Czech Republic and across the European Union and indeed globally, a tribute to those, not only the medical doctors, but also all the professionals in the health sector that were throughout the pandemic at the very forefront of our common fight. So let's witness, let's watch and uh, hear a very brief three minute video from one of the many uh, Portuguese doctors in the forefront of, of the fight against COVID-19. So, uh, Antonieta Dias, one of the Portuguese medical doctors at the front line of the fight against COVID. O meu desempenho como, uh, como funcionário neste hospital é ser médica de família no atendimento permanente. Faz, faz hoje, precisamente, um ano, dois, 10 de março, que eu assisti o primeiro doente que testou o Covid positivo. Nesse dia, ainda não tínhamos a noção da catástrofe que iríamos experienciar, apesar de já termos sido informados no dia 11 de março de 2020, que a Organização Mundial de Saúde tinha declarado a Covid-19 como pandemia. No dia 12 de março de 2020, na data do meu aniversário, fiquei em isolamento social porque tinha prestado assistência a um doente que tinha sido testado Covid positivo. Este foi o meu primeiro impacto negativo, desencadeado pela vivência da pandemia Covid-19. O isolamento social implicava ficar sozinha, sem apoio dos meus familiares e dos meus amigos, e foi o que aconteceu. Por uma questão de segurança e proteção, a minha família passou a viver noutro local. Esta decisão foi dolorosa para ambas as partes. Quando retomei a minha atividade profissional, 14 dias depois de ter prestado assistência a esse doente, tudo mudou na minha vida. Passei a viver com um dilema diário, pelo risco de poder vir a ser contagiada pelo vírus, durante a prestação de cuidados de saúde aos pacientes que recorriam ao hospital. Estava na linha da frente. Sabia que a infecção por coronavírus era uma doença cujo risco clínico ainda não estava totalmente definido e não se conhecia com exatidão o padrão da trans transmissibilidade. A minha prestação de cuidados aos doentes na linha da frente passou a ser exercida com imenso sacrifício, pelo risco de vida permanente para os doentes que padeciam de infecção pelo vírus e pelos profissionais que os tratavam, devido ao elevado grau de infecciosidade da doença e à incerteza da sua evolução. Dispunha de todo o equipamento de proteção pessoal, touca, viseira, máscara, cóbula, barra de proteção, luvas, manguitos, perneiras. Porém, cada turno era uma incógnita pela probabilidade de uma possível infecção. Quando chegava à casa, completamente exausta, com a face macerada pela máscara, revivo o dia que tinha passado e pensava nas máscaras que era obrigada a usar e que ocultavam os meus lábios e me dificultam o respirar. A viseira, que quase oculta os meus olhos, os meus óculos ficavam permanentemente embaciados, as vatas de proteção insustentáveis pelo calor que provocavam e pelo suor que escorria permanentemente pelo meu corpo. As luvas dificultavam o contacto com o doente e a realização de registros no processo clínico da aplicação informática. As primeiras escorregam demasiado, provocando o risco de quedas. Esta forma de prestar cuidados tornava o meu dia ainda mais penoso. Apesar do receio de manter sempre a serenidade, a paciência, a disponibilidade, para cumprir o meu dever, exercer as minhas funções com coragem, zelo, dedicação aos meus doentes e sempre com a esperança de um dia que esta pandemia terminará. Porém, o desempenho laboral nestas circunstâncias não é nada fácil, porque todos os dias admitimos doentes no hospital, extremamente graves e com necessidade de serem internados nos cuidados intensivos. Well, the, this was really a moving uh, moment, uh, but I think a very indispensable ingredient to our debate, uh, really to, to, to witness uh, the daily uh, lives of our 
the medical doctors and other professionals that both in Portugal, the Czech Republic, across the board, globally, are fighting, are fighting on our behalf to, to, to win against the pandemic. Now, let me, without any, uh, any pause, any further ado, bring to our first panel. The first panel will be moderated by my uh, good friend, uh, Sergeant Matic. Sergeant Matic is the head of the Czech branch of the world health organization. He is an experienced public health practitioner, and he has been following the situation in the Czech Republic throughout, being an indispensable interlocutor uh, to uh, the dwellings of the ambassadors of the European Union here in Prague and uh, in, the, in the entire uh, Czech Republic. Uh, uh, Sergeant Matic will introduce the speakers now he is going to be the master of the, the game. Uh, you will have 15 minutes more. Uh, so I am also being very generous. They granted me 15 minutes more for the initial panel. I am also giving you the same uh, privilege. Please take uh, into account that you have a member of the Portuguese government with you, the Portuguese Deputy Minister of Health that just uh, joined us and also uh, the other very high level participants. It is a very impressive panel. Uh, you will manage it uh, uh, carefully, of course, and uh, in your usually uh, savvy and uh, wise and knowledgeable way. Let me only point out that we have uh, three of the most prominent Portuguese medical doctors, and we have also uh, two of the directors of the medical schools based in Prague, the third one will join the second panel amongst very uh, uh, other very high level uh, Czech uh, participants. So we have uh, uh, the Lux uh, first panel and the surgeon. Now the floor is yours. Uh, watching you. Um, also, if you need anything from my side, uh, please call on me. I will gladly join the discussion. Sergeant Matic, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Luis, for the uh, kind invitation to be part of this uh, interesting and important conference, and uh, also for giving me the responsibility to moderate the second panel of the conference. I'm very honored by that. Uh, as Luis mentioned, uh, we have been working very closely here throughout uh, my time and Luis's time uh, in Prague. But uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic also, uh, we spent uh, quite an effort to try to link the diplomatic community uh, with also relevant authorities and partners in the Czech Republic and to get engagement from everybody in the response and uh, sharing of information. Uh, the, we have uh, six participants in this uh, first panel. I understand that uh, you decided, uh, Luis, to uh, ask Dr. Vidimsky to join the second panel, right, uh, instead. Uh, but we have a surprise appearance by the uh, Portuguese uh, Deputy Minister of Health, uh, who will join this panel. And uh, in in this uh, following one and a half hours, we should be looking at the health challenges in the post-COVID world. Yes, Louise. Uh, 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 sorry, Sergeant, for the interruption. Dr. Vidimsky will participate in your panel too. Okay. Uh, but the next panel will be uh, Professor Kamaris. So okay. Professor Vidimsky will be with you. Okay. okay, thank you. Then we are going to have seven panelists in this uh, session. Um, and uh, I would uh, really like to draw everybody's attention to the title of it, which is Health Challenges in a Post-COVID World. And uh, based on a very uh, thoughtful and comprehensive bird eye view on the current situation with the pandemic and the challenges that uh, it poses, and the weaknesses that the pandemic has uh, uncovered for all of us, uh, I think we need to start thinking two steps ahead, which is what happens 
when the pandemic is over and what are the challenges not only for health but uh, in in uh, first place for the healthcare systems in various countries in Europe and here in Czech Republic so I will just for two minutes uh, would like to point uh, certain uh, main issues from the perspective of the World Health Organization and uh, from the pre-COVID times I think there are maybe five uh, separate points to, to keep in mind and to recall, uh, which are very important also for the future. One is that uh, the hospital capacity or the capacity of the healthcare system in Czech Republic was um, somewhat greater than the uh, EU average. And actually, for many years, Czech Republic has been criticized for uh, being very slow in downsizing the hospital system. But uh, I would say that uh, this is probably one of the factors why uh, the Czech Republic was able to cope uh, with an incredible number of patients who uh, need uh, hospital care here um, in the country uh, during this uh, unprecedented outbreak of COVID-19. Yeah. The second thing is um, the health expenditure in Czech Republic, which was at the average or below the average of the European Union. The third factor is that uh, Czech Republic had, uh, up to the beginning of the pandemic, the highest level of financial protection in Europe, which means that out of pocket uh, expenditures for health here were below three or four percent, which is uh, quite rare uh, globally. And uh, actually, we found almost no people in Czech Republic who were pushed into poverty because of the health expenditures. The first one is that uh, there have been a chronic shortage of uh, healthcare personnel in the country. And in the past four years, there were some serious uh, efforts to increase the number of uh, healthcare workers to stabilize the workforce by investing heavily in 2019 and later in the um, capacities of medical schools and nursing schools in the country, but also increasing the status and the remuneration for the healthcare workers. And the fifth one is uh, the process of digitalization of the healthcare system here in Czech Republic. And I think those are the five uh, sort of key areas that uh, also uh, should be continued in the future, uh, where there were uh, some significant gains achieved in this country, and which should be the basis also of achieving certain goals in the future. And among those goals, I think, first of all, is for the country to uh, maintain universal access. Uh, and to do so, we really need to understand what will be the needs um, of the people uh, here. And uh, one of the, I think, most uh, important emerging issues is the long term COVID, uh, with millions of people across Europe uh, being infected and exposed to the virus. We will also have millions of people who are going to have chronic health uh, issues and disabilities because of uh, being uh, COVID survivors. We don't know much about it yet. We don't know exactly how many of them uh, will suffer from it, but it's certainly going to add greatly to the burden of the disease and on the pressures of the healthcare system to provide uh, basically services for chronic management of various diseases. The second, um, the second, uh, I think, objective should be to ensure that the high levels of financial protection are maintained, and that uh, the capacities of the healthcare systems uh, continue to be sustainable uh, in the long run. The third one is uh, a push for uh, the organization of service delivery, uh, and uh, the pandemic has been a very strong impetus for that. First of all, by uh, uh, resorting to task, task shifting within the healthcare system, uh, to um, uh, informatization, and also to uh, managing the, the work uh, workforce, and looking at uh, primary healthcare as being one of the pillars of a well uh, organized and optimized uh, healthcare system. Uh, and finally, what uh, certainly the pandemic of COVID-19 in Europe taught us is that we are not, we were not prepared for uh, a crisis of these proportions. 
that a crisis uh, will come sooner or later again. And uh, that obviously uh, the country has to invest significantly in preparedness, both uh, into the, let's say, preventative and clinical medicine to be able to cope and have some resilience and some elasticity to compensate for increased needs uh, in a short run, but also uh, should look at, uh, I would say, a thorough reform of the public health systems, what is understood here in Czech Republic as the sanitary epidemiological services to make them fit for the 21st century. So with this very brief uh, nine points that I wanted to, to outline, I would move uh, straight into uh, introducing our panelists and getting forward to them for their uh, opening remarks. Uh, I was asked to ask you to, to be brief, uh, so we leave time for discussion and reflections. So I hope that uh, in two, three, four minutes, uh, you could uh, put forward your initial thoughts. And I would first like to invite the Deputy Minister of uh, Health of Portugal uh, to take the floor um, since he has joined us now. So Mr. Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was having some some uh, technical difficulties with my with my laptop, so uh, you probably see the, the name Isabel Isabel Freire below below my my face. Um, Isabel uh, works works with me, and I'm using I'm using her computer. So well, uh, this is was the fastest way um, that I could participate and and not. Um, and not uh, delay any further our um, our conference. I would like, obviously, to 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 thank um, the kind invitation from um, Mr. Mr. Ambassador um, for um, joining such a um, such a distinguished uh, audience. Obviously, these these discussions are very re very relevant for us. And um, I totally agree that uh, we have to keep our eyes on the on the future. Um, this this pandemic is, is something like we've never seen before. Not even the oldest uh, of of us. Uh, we it's a new experience uh, in in terms of of its uh, global reach and in terms of the impact uh, it has on our health systems and and obviously on uh, our economies and and our societies. Um, and uh, th there are certainly lessons to to be learned. Uh, there are certain certainly uh, things that we uh, will take some time uh, analyzing and uh, you know uh, studying and and getting the data that is essential to to reach the the, um, the, the best conclusions in terms of of policy. Uh, of policy uh, for uh, for our countries, obviously for for the European um, Union. Um, I would like to 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 focus my my contribution to to our discussion, um, uh, if uh, if you don't mind, uh, on the priorities pursued by the, the Portuguese presidency, um, specifically in the field of health, and uh, what's the pathway that we see um, towards uh, a more resilient and, and so, solid health. And system. Um, so we will focus our attention on three major targets: reinforcing the EU's ability to to respond to public health crisis, which is obviously needed um, by responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also by contributing to building an European health union and promoting global health objectives, promoting a sustainable and universal access to medicines and uh, medical devices, and uh, championing championing uh, digital health as a part uh, of the EU's uh, digital transformation. Um, we we will have, we are having a, a, as a key goal um, to, to reinforce the European Union's ability to respond. And our focus will continue uh, to be given to ensuring an efficient role out of the COVID-19 vaccination plans. Uh, as we know, it's, it's the, the the light at the end of, of this long tunnel that, that we are all um, into right now. Um, 
we will continue to provide all support needed in order to ensure that more vaccines are made available uh, through the proper channels. We, we really do believe that only together um, we can be stronger to fight to fight this, uh, this, this pandemic. And so uh, it, it is very, very clear for us um, the, the full focus on working together and, and not uh, as, as separate health systems, because that will all, all only um, be prejudicial to, to uh, the efforts of every, every country in the European Union. When we look to the post-COVID-19 future, um, we think that uh, the EU's response will be greatly improved by um, the approval of building a European, uh, a European health union legislative package as proposed by, by the Commission. Um, we do um, believe in, in this, in this uh, proposal um, specifically, uh, uh, and we will try to build on it uh, during the first semester of, two, so of this year, of 2021. Um, that means uh, those three uh, initiative, uh, those three legislative initiatives, um, that is the um, the revision of the mandate of the European Centre for of ECDC to ensure um, that uh, national agencies start to play a more active role in the channeling of relevant information to the ECDC. You can only work if you have the right the right info. Also, the revision of Emma's mandate, um, as we believe that there are significant advantages um, on in increasing the collaboration between national authorities and the Emma, and uh, also the revision of decision uh, 1082 from 2013 uh, on serious cross-border health uh, threats. Um, these are our three initiatives that that. Uh, um, we, we are striving to 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 build upon uh, to to build um, to reach an end result that is a coherent, uniform, and effective system to fight cross-border health threats and public health emergencies at a European Union um, level. So this is uh, obviously very very important. When it comes to predicting future health crises, um, we need to also to, to work together and um, to, to develop more efficient surveillance networks that can monitor, tackle and react um, and do that as quickly as, as possible. But uh, obviously, um, health education is also paramount. Um, the response to any public health crisis can only be efficient if we communicate in a clear way if this communication is understood uh, by the public, and that uh, obviously has to include health education initiatives to empower citizens and to make them more um, um, able to to um, to make the right choices when, when dealing with this, this kind of, of public health uh, crisis. Um, regarding access to medicines and medical devices, um, we we uh, are very obviously very very busy with this thing, and um, the cost of of uh, medicines and medical devices has been a significant burden um, in in, um, in our uh, in all our national health systems, I would say. But but obviously also has has given our citizens more um, health and a better quality of of life, and that is obviously really, really important. Um, the question here being that uh, in recent years, European countries have experienced constraints with the availability and in some countries affordability of, of medicines. Um, we uh, think that uh, Europe should secure the supply of essential medicine and avoid shortages. That, that means uh, a further reindustrialization re terms of this sector and uh, we, we think that we can um, contribute to, to uh, by stimulating uh, the country's uh, own production capacity and reinforcing the supply chain which has, which is as important as the production capacity. Uh, we will submit a document uh, of council conclusions on, on, on this on this subject for approval of, of all member state um, in the uh, EBSCO meeting in June. Um, and uh, uh, hope we we can reach a um, uh, sustainable path to for, for this for this uh, for this subject. 
Um, finally, I, I have to ask you to, to, to conclude because yeah. uh, I am a human. I, am we, a, we meant, I, I apologize for interrupting you, but sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, I have to leave uh, uh, some time for interaction later on as well. Of course, of course, of course. The, the the final thing being being digital, being digital health, uh, which is which is a well known thing to, for for um, for everyone. Um, citizens' digital skills, better infrastructures for storage, etc., etc. I will um, I will um, conclude, leaving you um, with a, a message of hope. Um, this this uh, past month, uh, the European Union has been able to overcome. Um, and for unforeseeable and frankly remarkable obstacles and it did so by coming together this is the most important message i think the, this pandemic can can teach us that uh, together we work better and it's the uh, by far the best way of dealing with uh, with uh, this public health uh, things thank you very much for your time thank you mr deputy minister apologies again for uh uh, warning you about it, uh, but we are very grateful for outlining the Portuguese priorities and the vision for post-COVID times and also for uh, recalling the, the various uh, initiatives uh, within the European Union and also the issues that Portuguese pres presidency wants to take forward in that respect. Uh, our second uh, panelist is, uh, is uh, John Ryan, who is a Director for Public Health at uh, the uh, Director General for Health and Consumers uh, of the European Commission. Uh, John has been with the Commission for quite a while now, almost 10 years, um, coming from Ireland, and uh, he has been in a central position really uh, advising and running some of the most important common services of the European Union when it comes to health, to cross-border health, but also to day-to-day -day work on a variety of, of issues such as communicable diseases, vaccinations, influenza, preparedness, um, and international cooperation on health uh, security. He's also an old friend of WHO. We have been working with John uh, almost daily, I think, uh, since you came to the Commission. And uh, uh, John is also <coughs> representing uh, the Commission on the Management Board of the uh, European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction in Lisbon and of the European Centers for Disease Control in Stockholm. So he's one of the central people in bringing these things together at the level of the European Commission. And I have a great pleasure to introduce John to our conference. Uh, John, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction. I think I could speak on um, many topics, but I'd like to perhaps focus on a topic that was mentioned by the Deputy Minister, which is the issue of how we can strengthen our legislation based on the lessons learned so far. Now, of course, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. We're not out of it yet. But we decided on the Commission side that we should try and see what lessons we could already pick up from the, uh, the outbreak so far and make a proposal for strengthened legislation um, uh, to the Council and the Parliament, the European Council and the Parliament. Now, let me just say that, uh, of course, the Commission can do a lot in terms of funneling and channeling uh, budgetary resources this way and that. We can, I mentioned earlier on the, the recovery package, I mentioned the multi-annual financial framework, all of the programs we have, uh, you know, the, the European Investment Bank as well is very active in that regard. But I think, uh, from the Commission perspective, the gold standard is also the possibility to legislate. And I think um, one of our ambitions was to try and see where the weak points were in our legislation and to try and propose improvements. And therefore, uh, in November uh, last year, we proposed a package which contains ideas for reinforcing uh, the EU's resilience for cross-border health threats. We put a, a chapter heading or title on this package, which was building the European Health Union. Now, in view of what I said earlier on about the treaty, uh, people might say, well, are they stretching the limits here? 
let me say that from the Commission point of view, we had to operate within the existing treaty. And therefore, we've tried to be ambitious, as ambitious as we can be within our existing uh, legal framework. But I must admit, we're going to the limits uh, with our proposal. Uh, I think there's good reason for doing so. So first of all, the first part of the uh, proposal is, is sort of the concept. We need to build a stronger capacity for surveillance, for preparedness, for early warning, for risk assessment and response at the European Union level. We have to make sure that we have a good radar screen with all of the threats uh, visible and all of the elements of data which we need to manage a crisis efficiently. We need to have good uh, coordination mechanisms in place and we need to learn the lessons from joint procurement. Because for all of these areas, I think we have seen that the system can be improved. And uh, that's why the first uh, proposal that we're making is for a regulation on serious cross-border threats to health. And just to pick out one or two examples, the idea of having more um, transparent and more, um, uh, how should I say, more operational pandemic preparedness plans. Anybody who is online, uh, uh, anybody who's online will be familiar with the work we've been doing for maybe 20 years now on building pandemic preparedness plans. And of course, we'd probably be worse off now today if we had not done that work. But on the other hand, we can see that it was completely insufficient. So uh, what one of the ideas we have, and I'm not going to go into detail on all of this, one of the ideas we had is that we should have a possibility to check on the ground the, uh, the reality of these preparedness plans, because there's nothing worse than having a piece of paper or even 100 pieces of paper saying how well prepared the country X is. And then when the problem hits, that particular country, you discover that maybe they don't have uh, contracts in place for, for medicines, maybe they don't have masks, maybe they don't have the staff to deal with the crisis. So the reality check, if you like, is one of the ideas that we think is important on the preparedness side, uh, rather than, and, and the WHO has beaten us to this, I must say, because they have been organizing these country visits for some time now, uh, country evaluation visits to check how the international health regulations have been properly applied or not in, in individual countries. So we are proposing to do the same, but at the level of the EU27 and to report the results publicly to the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. And we hope that this mechanism, it's not intended to point fingers, it's not intended to, to say, well, this country is you know, uh, the best and this is the worst. That's not the idea. The idea is to identify where the gaps are and then to channel our funding, our financial support more intelligently to those areas. The whole uh, area of epidemiological surveillance and data collection is full of gaps. And we have data sets which are incomplete. For example, uh, the uh, supply chain for pharmaceuticals is very, very difficult to get a handle on. And yet it's so important when we're trying to develop coordinated response measures. Because if you don't have the possibility to count on pharmaceutical um, supply chains, you don't even know sometimes where these chains are originating or what the delays are until it's too late then, uh, you know, these data sets that we have are really basic indicators on communicable diseases. But if you want to control an outbreak of a communicable disease, particularly a pandemic, <coughs> you do need to have data in a much wider sense. Uh, also on healthcare uh, worker availability, on the availability of intensive care units, a whole series of indicators which we don't have collectively at the moment. I'm not speaking about sending all this to Brussels every week. That's not the intention. The intention is to help the member states themselves to know what's going on. Because if you're in a health ministry, believe me, on a national level, you would be in the same situation as the Commission Health Department. You would not have access to more information than we have. 
So I think it's a mutual problem of having a good um, uh, a good vision of where the problems are. Uh, a third uh, area of our legal proposal is in relation to early warning. And here, um, very often the problems may occur outside the health sector. For example, uh, if there were to be a problem in relation to uh, the supply chain for medical radioisotopes because of the, uh, the nuclear uh, supply chain not being sufficiently solid. If there was a problem, for example, of an environmental threat, if there was a problem of a drug product, an illegal drug product, uh, which uh, was causing infection in, in some of our vulnerable populations in Europe. So we need to try and link up all these different alert systems to make them more coherent and more uh, interoperable, and that we don't have separate alerts on animal health and separate alerts on pharmaceuticals and so on, whereas the threat is actually a cross-border threat. And on the response side, I mean, uh, we have a system in place through the Health Security Committee, which allows the member states to coordinate their position. But we are proposing strengthening of that approach and the possibility for the Commission to implement temporary measures in the case of a, a public health emergency. So we are proposing very, very new ideas and very uh, far reaching ideas, I think, will be for the European Council and the Parliament to decide how far they want to go on the basis of our proposal. I should mention as well, as part of this proposal, we're also suggesting that the ECDC, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, should be, <coughs> should be reinforced both in terms of its competences and its resources. And the same thing would apply to the European Medicines Agency. And finally, just one word on the EU BARDA. Uh, those colleagues who are listening online will be perhaps familiar with BARDA, which is the uh, US <coughs> mechanism for preparedness for uh, serious threats, particularly in terms of developing, procuring, manufacturing, and stockpiling uh, medical countermeasures. We are proposing as part of our package a similar approach, which we would call the Health Emergency Operations uh, Authority, HERA. And we're already proposing first steps in that direction by launching support for development of vaccines for uh, the new variants. Uh, I think I mentioned that in my earlier presentation. So I'll stop there. I'm very happy to engage in the conversation later. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. As uh, an EU citizen, I'm very curious about uh, how far the discussions will go on the proposals that are on the table and how far the member states will be willing to push the borders. Um, usually, the health was uh, something that was kept nationally. It was uh, always a big business and the big employment cent uh, sector. So, uh, and minimal uh, competencies were given to the community. But I think pandemic did teach us that uh, on our own, we cannot make it. So uh, it calls for a serious review of the architecture. And then as WHO, I can only say thank you for, for a very close and sincere collaboration that we have uh, in these, uh, on these issues, uh, the work with the ECDC and with the commission and uh, with various parts of the commission and mechanisms uh, is essential for WHO, uh, not only by uh, utilizing the mechanisms for the non-EU countries, uh, for example, in, in case of the WHO European region, where we can enlarge the pool of data collection and surveillance and early warning mechanisms and also interventions, uh, but uh, it is a great contribution to global guidance and uh, uh, using it as a best practice uh, for countries in other parts of the world. So uh, not to mention that Commission plays an incredibly important role in uh, global solidarity in the efforts to procure vaccines for the developing countries or the resource constraint places to provide direct assistance and also to support the organization. So for us, uh, we are closely watching and supporting the efforts of the Commission in this area 
and uh, are very interested to continue working very closely. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move to our next panelist, and our next panelist is uh, Senor Felipe Froes, who is a head of intensive care unit at the hospital Pulido Valencia in Portugal. Uh, and uh, I will say from your biography, the most important thing is that you are consultant to the Director General of Health and uh, an expert member of the National Technical Commission on Vaccinations. So, Mr. Froes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and sharing our experience. I'm a frontline medical doctor. I am the ICU director of a COVID ICU. And if I'm allowed, I prepare a few slides to uh, stress my uh, opinion. Yes, and I think you are seeing my slides. Don't worry, there are very few. First of all, we must remember that uh, pandemics are part of the history. They are not what the economists call the black swan, the highly improbable event. Pandemics are part of the history. The sole uncertainty is when they will occur. But uh, now we have an opportunity to change history because what history taught, taught us, and I'm quoting Friedrich Hegel, the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. And now we have an opportunity to change history and to deal what we learn from this pandemic. And so far, most of the who we deal with this pandemic can be uh, re, um, uh, said in two simple words, cycles of panic and cycles of neglect. In the beginning, we have panic. Now we are facing indifference and neglect. Why was this pandemic unavoidable, uh, inevitable? Because of the world we are constructing, and some part of this world is good because we have global interconnection, but also because of the climate changes that sometimes are destructing natural habitats. And also we are seeing a lot of migratory flows, extreme social inequities, and we are facing a big problem, and this can be a big problem in the future of this pandemic. We have underestimation of knowledge. Uh, we, for example, fake news is a big problem. We are also facing a new virus, and this virus have the adaptive advantage. For example, uh, they can transmit uh, the virus from asymptomatic patients. We have we have also another advantage for for this virus because. Is the first pandemic with coronavirus. The previous pandemics were with influenza virus. And as previously, as previously said by uh, former speakers, in 2009, we had another pandemic, the 2009 influenza A, H1N1 pandemic, and the things went very well, so well that this caused us a false perception of safety and security, and we decreased our level of robustness. We need to increase our risk assessment, we need to increase our surveillance, and we decreased after the 2009 pandemic. How are the challenges for the post-COVID world? We must realize that COVID, post-COVID is not over. And after this crisis period, these actual phases, we are going to continue to see sporadic and contained outbreaks. And this means for national health systems that we need to maintain capacity of diagnosis and isolation. Probably we can see that COVID will evolve to possible uh, seasonal recurrent illness. And this means we need epidemiolo epidemiologic and virological surveillance systems because we are going to face mutations and the impact of mutations is not clear until now. And probably we need per periodical revaccination, annual, biannual, along with flu, we, we don't know yet. So next winter is still a mystery regarding COVID-19 because it will depend on the evolution of the virus, the duration of the immunity of the illness and the, the vaccine, and the, the global situation in the different parts of the world. So the coming winter, we are going to face an increase in survival and transmission of the virus in result of the cold, the closed spaces, the crowds. Probably people are uh, exhausted and with lower motivation for non-pharmacological interventions, like, for example, the use of the masks, the end hygiene. 
We don't know the duration of the immunity of the vaccine and the illness. This means we could face reinfections and the impact of the new strains and new mutations. We didn't vaccinate children and some mutations can have impact in transmission from children. And this is also a mystery. And the, the, we have probably will have a possible higher flu activity next winter. And we know that the influenza virus can act as a Trojan horse, horse then predispose COVID disease and simultaneous can act as a perfect storm to increase the damage by SARS-CoV-2. And we, don't, we cannot forget that we are going to have clusters of virus in countries with no vaccines and higher occurrence. So after pandemics, we, meet, we must know that we must avoid the pandemonium from the other diseases and the other disturbance, like for example, misinformation, fake news. We, we need to face the problem of climate changes with more, most strongly than, than after. We need to face the problem of natural habitats, poverty and inequity. And we are going to face, still face acute COVID and long COVID. And I'm, I'm going to recall some few numbers. One in three patients discharged are going to be readmitted because of COVID sequela. And one in eight patients discharged will die from sequela from COVID. And this means a huge impact in national health systems. Of course, we have an impact of non-COVID diseases because we have millions of appointments and procedures behind, like for example, surgeries. Some patients with oncological immunosuppression, autoimmune diseases, mental health, obesity, immature chronicity will be affected by this pandemic. And we need to have more time to deal with these problems. And we cannot, we, we cannot uh, forget the problem of flu next winter and the excessive use of antimicrobials during this pandemic that will increase the problems of antimicrobial resistance. In the other way, we have also to face that the national health systems need to maintain capacity for diagnostic COVID. Most of our, we, uh, we have to recover from the, all the patients we left behind. Most of our, our medical doctors and other professional health care are exhausted and we need time to rest and we need time to, uh, to balance our lives. Uh, we need to requalify -re facilities we used for COVID and to return to not COVID, and this means investment and money, but also like everything is like a two coins. We need, this is also an opportunity to increase our evaluation from science and knowledge, increase our evaluation of national health systems, increase our opportunity to refund the national health system and to reuse synergies, equipments and infrastructures. To finish, the pandemic has reinforced the relevance and importance of the science and the knowledge, civil society and national health systems. And I think European Centers for Disease Control must also be reinforced to face future situations and the post-pandemic challenges. And my final quote will be from COVID-19 to zero COVID, it will take its time and life will never go back to how we knew it. And probably we need to live. Now we can tell, we can say this: the new normal. The new normal will be after pandemic. Thank you very much. I will finish to to share my slides. And I'm a George. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Flores. Uh, thank you for a sobering reminder that uh, we we need to remind ourselves that the discussion for uh, the world after COVID will only uh, make sense when we finish the COVID pandemic and it is an unfinished business. Um, as um, the Deputy Minister said, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so at least now with the vaccines, we know that it's not an express train that is coming towards us 200 kilometers per hour, uh, but that it's really light at the end of the tunnel. We just don't know how long this tunnel is. And I think that is the reminder that you put in front of us. Thank you very much. It's an important uh, uh, body of, of considerations when talking about the future in this uh, situation. I will move then uh, and introduce our next uh, speaker. That is uh, uh, Senor Miguel Moragedes, 
who is the head of the Department of Neurosurgery um, at uh, Hospital Santa Maria in Lisbon. But uh, he's uh, because he's a member of the scientific committee of uh, the Mask for All Movement, uh, which uh, suggested from very early time in the pandemic that uh, the uh, use of uh, face uh, covers and masks is essential uh, to uh, decent response to the pandemic. And before I give you the floor, let me just remind you, we have 35 minutes left for this uh, panel and we still have uh, four speakers, including you. So, uh, Mr. Gedesh, it's your turn, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Almeida Senpai for inviting me to speak today. It is an honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. Uh, I'm a neurosurgeon at the private hospital in Lisbon, and by mid-March last year, we were confronted with a sudden surge in COVID admissions. Uh, it was the beginning of what would be our first wave of the pandemic and also our first lockdown. All routine surgeries were cancelled and then I found myself temporarily out of work. Uh, I was out of the front line, deeply concerned and eager to help, but the scale of the problem was overwhelming and at first sight somewhat alien to my training. However, there was an immediate priority concerning the spread of COVID among hospital staff, particularly in the operating room, and that was a more familiar subject. It was necessary to expand the use of personal protective equipment with goggles, face shields, respirator masks, and establish new rules of conduct. There was a general consensus regarding the virtues of physical distancing, cost etiquette, and hand hygiene, but public health authorities, particularly in Western countries, were reluctant to advise the general public to wear masks. You see, wearing a mask is second nature to a surgeon and struck me as self-evident that they would be paramount in the fight against the respiratory disease of pandemic proportions. But somehow, health authorities thought otherwise. Searching for scientific evidence on its usefulness, I came across the Czech writer and entrepreneur Peter Ludwig's video, Masks for All. It was uh, the business card for an extremely well orchestrated nationwide media campaign, a community call to arms for the manufacture and use of face masks. It was exceptionally successful, encouraged similar movements worldwide, and I was one of those inspired to challenge the status quo. At the time when there were conflicting statements and contradictory information from public authorities, it was crucial to congregate the support of both the Portuguese Medical Association the National Public Health Association, and the Council of Portuguese Medical Schools. Attain that objective and with the generous collaboration of our Portuguese ambassador in the Czech Republic and of Peter Selepa, the Czech ambassador in Portugal, as well as numerous colleagues and friends, it was possible to build up on the existing network of like-minded institutions and individuals. We were working across Europe, mainly on social media, as a force for good, providing clear and reliable information. Eventually, face masks would become 2020's unlikely emblem, a symbol of solidarity, social responsibility, and a linchpin in the fight against COVID. However, every new and powerful technology has its dark side, and as our online campaign was unfolding, we've witnessed the simultaneous rise of a counterculture of COVID conspiracy theories and fake news spreading, spreading like wildfire on social media. There were plenty of reports of people ingesting toxic substances, serious adverse drug reactions from off-label prescriptions, online encouragement of risky activities and behavior, and more recently, anti-vaccine scaremongering. In this day and age, when many people rely on online health information to protect themselves and their families, the internet has both the power to inform or misinform. And if left unchecked, may represent an unprecedented threat to global human well-being. Effective public health communication requires, therefore, a continuous and articulated effort to gather, analyze, and validate scientific information, and the ability to produce and deliver a cohesive, trustworthy, and unambiguous message. It is largely dependent on a close cooperation between scientific institutions and political power. Last November, at the EU Health Summit, President of the European Commission and Medical Doctor, Ursula von der Leyen, stated, the coronavirus pandemic has highlighted the need for more coordination in the EU, more release, resilient health systems, and better preparation for future, future crises. Quoting Winston Churchill as it worked to establish the United Nations after World War II, never let a good crisis go to waste. As tragic and devastating as this pandemic turned out to be, 
we should not squander this opportunity to build a powerful and successful European health union. Thank you for your attention. much for your contribution statement. Um, it really brings uh, to the forefront uh, two very important um, lessons learned from the pandemic. One, the power and importance of community mobilization and engagement. Um, the example of uh, wearing masks uh, has been uh, in Czech Republic, one of the highlights, one of the glorious moments of Czech Republic in the pandemic uh, last year in spring. And uh, it showed uh, the importance of uh, actually uh, mobilizing the whole community in the response, and uh, that uh, there is no uh, there is no successful response without mobilizing people and mobilizing community, listening to communities. That's number one, and second is uh, the power and importance of communication that we highlighted. Thank you very much, uh, and I hope that we'll have uh, time to to reflect on that a little bit more. Uh, now I will um, introduce, uh, we have uh, three distinguished deans of uh, medical faculties. And the first one is uh, Professor uh, Fausto Pinto, who is uh, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Lisbon. A prominent uh, internist, expert in cardiology uh, with a well-known career and uh, and uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Pito. Well, thank you so much uh, for the kind uh, introduction, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank, of course, our ambassador in the, in Prague, and I think this has been a really an exciting uh, meeting. Uh, a special hug to my friend, uh, Professor Vidimsky. Uh, we know each other for a long time. We're friends uh, together uh, in different battles in the cardiovascular field for many years. It's a pleasure to review uh, him here at this meeting. Uh, I know time is short, so I will try to focus on a couple of uh, uh, topics. Of course, many things have been said, many different angles have uh, been looked at, and uh, we have very distinguished people and very experienced people, different fields, different areas that are already uh, explored and uh, pointed out to a lot of areas that are really relevant for uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with this, as we know, unique situation. I will focus on two main aspects, one related with uh, what I would call educational challenges and uh, uh, focusing on medical education. And, and using here my hat as, uh, as dean of a medical school, it's the biggest medical school in my country. And uh, uh, altogether we had to face, and, uh, and this was across the board, not only of course uh, in a single country, but uh, um, across the world, uh, all of a sudden the need to rethink uh, the model of how to uh, not compromise medical education for the future doctors and particularly in the setting of a very complex situation as a pandemic uh, is. Um, and uh, that is, it, it is, it, uh, it was, it is and will continue to be uh, a challenge. Uh, it's at the same time, uh, this type of, uh, and this is a cliche, but it's true that uh, it brings new opportunities. So bad things like a pandemic, on, uh, they have the other side of the coin, which are some opportunities that can be uh, discovered and explored. And of course, here, the whole field of uh, uh, different, uh, developing different tools of uh, uh, education, uh, different platforms, the whole digital world, which was applied not only for education, but also for health. Uh, the, whole, the, the whole area of telehealth or telemedicine is as you want to call it, uh, but particularly focusing on education, this has been one area that had a huge development, and I'm convinced that that will stay. And that actually, uh, in a way, helped us also, was kind of a push to help us to rethink even some of the models that we're using, um, I would say conventional models. We all like to innovate, particularly the ones of us involved in uh, uh, medical education and medical teaching. That there's a lot of new things, a lot of new ideas, a lot of new theories. And this, I think, was a huge opportunity to also adapt and include some of, uh, because we were forced to, uh, to, uh, to do that. At the same time, the challenge is uh, to continue in that, uh, and talking with some of my colleagues around the world, we're facing the same challenges. At the beginning, we had to close the universities. Now the challenge is actually to, con despite the fact that we still have lockdowns in different countries. My country is in lockdown right now. Uh, how can we continue to have proper medical education even under lockdown circumstances? And that's something 
that uh, we at our medical schools council, uh, we've been discussing a lot of these issues and uh, we thought it was really important that our medical students will continue to be, particularly the ones on the clinical cycles, will continue to be exposed to uh, uh, to practical, to be in the hospitals, to be adapted to uh, the circumstances and actually being trained even for the next pandemic or to use this as a, as a wonderful tool uh, of medical uh, of medical education. Of course, this has implications in terms now of vaccination, in terms of uh, protecting the, the, the students, but also protecting the patients and uh, uh, and protecting the uh, and basically setting the stage in a way that uh, this could be achieved. The goal being proper medical education for the future doctors, and that's so that's one of the things I would like you to you know just to. Uh, to to raise, of course, the whole education is being challenged. Uh, we know that, but I would just like to focus on medical education. And uh, and the second main topic, which has been already uh, approached by some of the previous speakers, is is a health challenge, and that has to do. I, I'm a cardiologist, and uh, and uh, what we are facing now uh, is and in the first part of the pandemic, uh, and, and that was again across the world, we saw a decline. In the number of patients coming to the hospital with, for instance, acute myocardial infarction, with strokes, uh, with acute conditions, and what we observed was actually a decrease uh, in the uh, in the in, in the number of patients coming with these acute conditions, an increase in mortality of these patients because basically the ones who were coming they were coming either late or they were coming already with uh, conditions that were more difficult to treat. Uh, and this was one of the big challenges that that uh, we, we had and we still have. And that's why across the world also, medical societies, scientific societies, uh, very much foundations, you know, basically uh, 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 together trying uh, to organize systems in a way that uh, we can bring back trust to the population. Because, you know, now we know much more about the disease, we know much more about uh, how to organize the uh, the health system so we can be able to uh, uh, to cope with uh, of course the COVID we have to cope with uh, uh, with this and we know it's going up and down and probably we're still not rid of that but at the same time to be able to cope uh, with all these other conditions that we can actually treat and keep in mind just for cardiovascular disease we have 18 million people that die every year across the globe with uh, with cardiovascular disease and we cannot neglect. These people, we cannot neglect this part of the population. So that's a challenge. Of course, it's not easy. And uh, we already have data coming from different parts of the world that show the excessive mortality, not only due to the COVID, but due to all uh, the other conditions that were not properly treated. And that's going to be, I would say, one of the big challenges that, of course, all of us are working on that, uh, working on models on, on how to organize. And we are doing that actually in, in practice, uh, uh, in practical terms. You know how to organize our hospitals, our health system, so we can cope with that. But that's a challenge. And uh, my final comment is, we have to treat. Uh, and, and I think there was a problem, and, and there was also. A It was being used more a political matrix than a medical matrix. Of course, we need both, but it's very important that science, we saw that, that science and the scientific community, the medical community are very much engaged in these type of problems, because that's what we do every day, you know, in these type of problems that the medical community, the scientific community is heavily engaged. Of course, the decision makers that have to take the decisions, the governments and the uh, the, 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 uh, the ones that have that uh, responsibility, but listen to the science, listen to the medical community, because the solutions for medical problems, for health problems will come from those communities. And the great example is, is, is the vaccine. Final comment, vaccination has to be global. Uh, WHO, you know that very well, you know, WHO, our, our general director is very much pushing in that direction. It's a global problem. Uh, we cannot solve the problem in Europe or in the US or in Japan. You know, we have to solve the problem uh, as a global problem. It has to be tackled as a global problem. And I think this is the time for the high income countries to help the uh, low and middle income countries to get over this situation. Because the problem will not be solved if we only solve it in part of the, of the goal. It has to be a global solution. 
Thank you so much for your attention. The honor to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your contribution to the panel. Uh, very important points of uh, what the new normal will look like. Um, so in terms of education, you said that what you had to do because of the pandemic and the lockdowns uh, may actually give you some creative ideas for what the new uh, normal uh, could look. Uh, you reminded us of the importance of the massive disruptions in services and also the impact, potential impact that it has on, on the health profile of the population and morbidity and mortality uh, in the future. Uh, a very important issue of science and policy interface. Um, I, I, want, I would like to say to that, I always uh, say that uh, transmission and infection is a microbiological or part of physio physiological process, but the pandemic is a man-made man -made process. So um, I think it's very important uh, to understand that uh, yeah, the main tools are going to be biomedical, let's say. Uh, then there is this whole big body of public health, which uh, falls under medicine and science, of course, but it has uh, a broad implication. A pandemic like this has broad implications on the status of economy, of um, demography, of social development. And uh, it's very important then for um, governments to try to behave rationally in this situation and to, uh, while they are accountable for the decisions, uh, at least they should be science informed, if not science based. Um, and because policy making is never uh, evidence based, it's uh, at the best evidence informed, right? Uh, but uh, we do have a lot of science. Uh, pandemic was also a moment when the uh, medical and uh, medical, social, and epidemiological development of knowledge was at the fastest speed ever in the history. We basically, every 20 minutes, one scientific peer reviewed article published on some topic related to COVID. So it's beyond the ability of people to follow the science in a way. Um, but uh, yes, we should be looking at new normal where we have a big scientific uh, uh, production and where we have to translate it into tools that the decision makers will understand and will be able to uh, use easily um, and to have evidence-based policies. Thank you for that. And now we have uh, two uh, deans of uh, two medical faculties from the Czech Republic. I have the pleasure to invite uh, Professor Martin Vokurka who is uh, head of the Institute of Pathological Physiology uh, and the Dean of the first Faculty of Medicine at the Charles University here in Prague. Uh, Professor Vokurka, the floor is yours. Professor Vokorka, we can see that you're connected, but we don't hear you. Uh, could I suggest, Sergeant, give the floor to Professor? Oh, no, uh, yes, if, if Professor Vokorka has difficulties in connecting uh, himself, sure. we could move to Professor Vidimsky and then come back to Professor Vokorka. Thank you very much. Of course. So, uh, Professor uh, Peter Vidimsky, is the Dean of the third faculty of medicine at the Charles University, a cardiologist by uh, specialty and uh, has been, has had a, a long uh, career uh, at the medical faculty here at the Charles University. And uh, he was, um, uh, he had a number of important roles both in international uh, cardiological uh, circles and is uh, one of the top uh, physicians in his uh, specialty area here uh, in the Czech Republic. It's a great pleasure to invite you, uh, Professor Vidimsky. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this interesting conference. It's a great honor for me to be part of this uh, interesting discussion. I'm also especially pleased uh, to see my friend Fausto Pinto, one of the world leaders in cardiology with whom 
we have been in touch for many years in the European Society of Cardiology. As said, I am working as Dean of the Cell Faculty of Medicine in Prague and Head of Cardiology Department. We face now, um, exactly in these days, we face now the most horrible situation in the Czech hospitals uh, with COVID-19, with unprecedented almost 9,000 patients hospitalized with severe COVID pneumonia in Czech hospitals. And the hospital capacities are completely full. Uh, the daily death rates, which I controlled uh, just today in the morning is, uh, for several countries, the daily death, death rates for COVID are currently 25 deaths per million per day in our country. And for comparison, Portugal has now this number only three. So these days, our country is eight times worse than Portugal. Maybe it would be interesting to hear how Portugal succeeded this because I, I know that you had severe problems a couple of weeks or, or a few months ago. And uh, I would just, I will not speak a long time, I would just uh, try to provoke a little bit the discussion. The title of this conference is uh, Health Challenges in Post COVID 19 World. But will there be any post COVID 19 world? Or rather, we have to accept that this dangerous virus will be with us for decades, maybe centuries, like plaque, like tuberculosis, or other deadly diseases in the past. Today, we are not yet able to predict who will be the winner, whether it will be effective and safe vaccination, or whether it will be coronavirus with its mutations overcoming every new vaccine. So far, politicians want to please their citizens, voters, by promising them that we will soon return to normal life and we will have a lot of post-COVID investments. I am a little bit skeptical, unfortunately, in this respect. I cannot see very soon return to normal life, unfortunately. So I think we should take seriously, although the option that this pandemic will not finish soon, and it may continue many years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your sobering statement, brief statement on uh, how difficult the situation in Czech Republic is today. It is really something that uh, everybody around the world is looking at and asking what can be done in such a situation and how can it be, uh, be brought down under control. And it, uh, I think it's all because of the extreme situation in which we are now here. It also shows the extreme signs of pandemic fatigue and uh, also irritation of the population with all the measures that are in place. For many of them, there is no alternative in a way. And uh, also at times it uh, prompts the discussion of uh, in the in the general public. Uh, about the choice between economy and health, which is a false dichotomy, actually. Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, what the pandemic did show us is that there is no normal economy without healthy population. And the exactly. shortest way to, to, to growth, to recovery, to rebuilding green or not green, but rebuilding in the future is to take care of the health. Uh, at the same time, we also, uh, at what population is most concerned of is, of course, the threat of poverty because of the pandemic. So uh, both individual uh, poverty, but also this is uh, going bankrupt on a, on a historical scale. So uh, yeah, uh, I don't envy any politician today in, in any country. They have very tough decisions and choices to make uh, and um, balance various uh, interests and pressures. Uh, but uh, I think fundamental uh, fundamental lesson is that without uh, normalizing health situation, there is no back to normal, both in terms of society or the economy. And um, it makes uh, all the points that were raised before uh, very relevant. Uh, what is part of the passage through the tunnel before reaching the light? But let me uh, let me see if. Uh, we have uh, our uh, last panelist here, um, whether Professor Vokurka is online. 
Can you hear Professor Vokurka? No, so I suggest then uh, that we open uh, the floor. We have about 10, 12 minutes. If Professor Vokurka manages to connect, I will give him the floor. Uh, but I would like to open the floor for reflections, both from all of our panelists, but also the colleagues and ladies and gentlemen who are online here uh, from the uh, plenary part of it and uh, who are here for the second panel as well. The floor, floor is open. You can use the function on the right side next to your name. You can raise your hand and we'll know that you would like to. Louis, would you like to, to make some reflections now after several speakers who participated? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sergeant, for, for that opportunity. But uh, let me, first of all, thank all the participants uh, for this remarkable panel. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we have a, a, an extraordinary array of participations uh, from uh, those that are not only uh, dealing with the pandemic uh, in their professional capacity, in the front line of the fight against the pandemic, but also because of their responsibilities, managing uh, either uh, important medical schools or uh, hospital units, uh, those that uh, are building the immediate uh, and the longer term post-pandemic uh, future. Uh, we uh, have a, a very interesting set of uh, a combination of the presentations, both in the initial panel and then uh, in this one. Let me only add, uh, knowing that we have unfortunately uh, limited time, and probably that uh, this reflection of mine will, will precede the concluding remarks by uh, Sergeant Matic, the uh, Czech-based uh, uh, representative of the World Health Organization. Uh, let me uh, uh, again uh, stress the importance uh, of the uh, human uh, dimension. Uh, we know very well that uh, what we are doing, fighting the pandemic, will have very important uh, social repercussions. Uh, we know that the world after the pandemic will be a different place. All in uh, each one of you in different uh, angles and manners, you reflected on, on that, the new normal that will come after the pandemic. It would be very important that that new normal will be a better normal. One of the things that I always uh, refer to in my conversations, either with my Czech interlocutors or in my participations in conferences like this one, is also about the importance of doing our best to counter, to fight against the widening generation gap. This is a dimension that was not spelled out by you in these precise terms, but it was implicit in your interventions. The pandemic, the social consequences, the societal consequences of it uh, in many circumstances in many countries and also across the European Union contributed to widening the generation gap. And I think that uh, for the sake of the cohesion of our societies, it would be extremely important that uh, in the long run, everything that we do keeps also that in mind. The importance of social cohesion uh, means also that we need to con reducing generation gap and to try to build a more cohesive society uh, also in that, uh, in that sense. Another dimension that was very much underlined by many of the speakers was the importance of international cooperation. Let me uh, tell you, uh, that uh, I see Portugal and the Czech Republic as uh, two ideal partners for 
very simple, uh, three very simple reasons. Our demographies are very similar. Both Portugal and the Czech Republic, we have more or less 10 million inhabitants. The size of our countries is uh, almost identical. Of course, we have very different geographies, Portugal being in the southern uh, westernmost part of uh, Europe, uh, facing the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, the Czech Republic being a landlocked Central European country surrounded by many neighbors. But the size of the territory is almost exactly the same. And the size of our economies is also very similar. And we are, both our countries, members of the so-called Group of Friends of Cohesion in the European Union, and we are uh, following the route that will one day lead us to real convergence in terms of economic and financial terms. It would be very important that we go on sharing experiences in the medical field. One of the things that I have been trying to convince our interlocutors here in the Czech Republic, we can learn a lot both ways uh, with and from each other. Uh, in Portugal, we have a medical hospital that is member of the Medical Aid Alliance, that extraordinary project developed by Chancellor Angela Merkel. And I am also uh, saying all the time to my uh, Czech colleagues and interlocutors that we are also there for them to put our experiences to, at their disposal, as I am sure our medical institutions have also a lot to learn from, from the, from the uh, uh, Czech medical experiences. So all in all, my message is about bilateral cooperation in the context of a wider European Union increasingly deepen cooperation, uh, trying uh, at the end of the tunnel again one day, uh, hopefully in the very near future, to have an European Union of health. And of course, that is always and also a reminder that the European Union is not isolated in a global context, but for that, the, the World Health Organization uh, is there to remind us of the global dimension. And uh, back to you, uh, Sergeant, to conclude this uh, uh, panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Um, there is not much to say uh, after you summed up some of the very important points from the discussion. But um, I think that uh, uh, the several key points that uh, transpire and which are also common thread for the presentations uh, that we heard from our panelists is, first of all, that we are not alone and we should neither do it alone and we should learn together also, not only work together, but also learn together. The um, solidarity is an important value uh, and principle that we should try to maintain. On the one hand, it is a global problem, the COVID pandemic, but uh, solidarity is also with, uh, in respect to inequalities that exist within countries and among countries. So we should not forget that uh, solidarity is also uh, important uh, with uh, our co-citizens and people who are less fortunate than us and who have maybe special needs or special impediments to and know how to protect themselves, how to improve their health, and how to improve their well-being. Uh, but it also extends to issues, of course, of global uh, and solid and action in solidarity to end the pandemic. Because if it's not finished everywhere, it's not finished anywhere, um, and that is an important principle. The second one is uh, empathy. I think that in extreme situations. Uh, Empathy of the people gets uh, tremendously challenged. And if you um, listen to some of the public debates around a prioritization of vaccines, I think it's very disturbing to hear people say, well, we should first vaccinate young people and not the old because the old are going to die anyway. Or during the discussions about mortality, um, uh, people started saying, well, it's really not surprising because it is the people who would die anyway. And uh, I think um, that the pandemic in many places around the world uh, seriously challenged the, the feeling of empathy in the community. 
And I think we have a responsibility to to build a sense of empathy in uh, the generations to come and the young generations, uh, because that, that is uh, something solidarity and empathy were uh, probably among the most important lessons learned after World War II. They were also the basis, uh, the, the, the I was emotional or sociological basis for the development of the European Union in many ways, the feeling of solidarity and empathy. And uh, we should transmit that to the new generations. And that ensures also social cohesion, which has also been uh, tremendously challenged uh, around the world. So um, I think that uh, in talking about health and what happens in terms of health after the pandemic, it's also about the mitigation measures at various levels that uh, have uh, been put in place. And um, I think that, uh, for example, if you talk about Czech Republic, Czech Republic has been quite a successful uh, country in terms of mitigation measures to protect uh, deterioration of economic status of the uh, population and also the broad, broad uh, very selfless uh, uh, expenditure of, of national resources on trying to protect those who need to be protected. So. Uh, I think this is a really worthwhile uh, topic to, to discuss in Czech Republic. And uh, we're out of time. Uh, so I'm giving the floor back to you, Luis, and thank you very, thank much, you very much, our panelists, uh, for the contribution and participation and for the patience of our uh, uh, listeners. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Right. Thank you very much to, to all of the participants. Let me say a word to address to Professor Martin Vokulka. We know that his contribution would be uh, of extreme uh, value to our panel, to our discussion. Uh, uh, we will reach out to Professor Vokulka in order to try to have his contribution in a different, uh, different form, either digital uh, or another format. Uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, that we are planning to have a publication of the main takeaways of our conference. But you will have, all of you, an opportunity to review the takeaways that we are going to include in that publication for you to feel totally com comfortable about that. And of course, we will include in that uh, uh, summary of the takeaways the contribution from Professor Vokulka that for technical reasons was not able to be uh, heard by us, even though he was uh, listening and following the uh, entirety of our debate. So again, thank you very much uh, to the host uh, uh, moderator and to all the participants of this remarkable uh, panel. Let me move uh, bridging immediately to the uh, final panel of our conference the one that will be dealing uh, essentially or mainly with investments, with strategic investments in health infrastructure and uh, with uh, innovation in the health industry. To moderate that uh, panel uh, will be uh, Natalie Binet. Uh, Natalie Binet is uh, the representative of the European Investment Bank in the Czech Republic. She leads the office of the EIB in uh, Prague, a uh, long uh, time uh, uh, partner of our embassy and of our project for the uh, presidency of the European Union. Uh, and I have to thank Natalie Vinet and her team by her uh, outstanding contribution to our uh, objectives. Um, um, let me also uh, mention uh, two things before I give the floor to Natalie Vinet. First of all, that the Deputy Minister uh, of the Czech Government, Deputy Minister for Health, of course, rejoined us in order to participate in this final panel. Uh, and that we have, as you could see by the list of uh, imposing personalities, only one Portuguese participant. So I I'm sure that my Czech friends will treat him very well for him not to feel isolated. To the contrary, he's going to be in a very prominent position because our callers 
uh, uh, are entirely being represented by him. It is a big responsibility on the shoulders of, uh, of uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Martins. So without any further comment, but I will join you at the very end of the panel for concluding remarks and, uh, and uh, farewell, uh, farewell remarks and thank you for the entire conference. Now the floor is uh, to Natalie Binet. Thank you very much for your kind words, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, it's really a great honor for the EIB to co-organize this event. Um, and it's true that we have worked already on several editions uh, of these conferences, and this one uh, was of particular interest to us. Uh, and I'm really delighted to introduce this panel focusing on strategic investment in the health infrastructure and innovation in the health industry. So we have already heard some themes uh, that have emerged from the previous panels, uh, be it um, the stabilization of, uh, distribu uh, of distribution and supply chains, be it uh, you know, the increase of production capacity, the innovation, uh, digital health. Um, and uh, we will, uh, in that panel, um, try to uh, take a forward-looking approach and to build on the lessons learned from this crisis to identify the key investment to be made in the health sector. And as I was saying, it will touch upon infrastructure, strategic autonomy, e-health and innovation. So today we really have uh, the chance to welcome a very high level and recognize experts. Um, we, uh, so we, we have the chance to, to, to welcome again uh, Deputy Minister Regnerova, uh, from the Czech Republic, um, uh, as well as uh, Felicitas Riedel, uh, who is uh, the head of the Life Science and Health Division in the European Investment Bank. And it consists of sector expert uh, that is in charge of uh, appraising health project in the EIB. Uh, the Professor uh, Vladimir Komarek, um, who is the Dean, uh, of uh, the second faculty of medicine um, and chairman of the association of medical faculties uh, in, in Prague and the Czech Republic. Uh, Mr. Carlos Neves Martins, uh, who was state secretary uh, for health in Portugal uh, in 2012 and 2013. And he has a very long experience in the field of health, notably as chairman of the Lisbon Academic Medical Center. And he now know has the position as business consultant for the company CAE. Uh, healthcare, um, as well docent uh, Jerzy Mali, uh, he's associate professor of surgery at the second uh, faculty of medicine, um, and uh, he's deputy uh, de director at ICHEM in Prague. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Jakub Vorjacek, uh, he has been uh, the executive di director of the Association of Innovative Pharmaceutical Industry of the Czech Republic since 2011. And he previously served as director of the investment division in Czech Invest. So we really have a very diverse uh, panel today. And I really think that we will have a and fruitful and I would say cross fertilizing approaches on all these topics. Um, I will start uh, with a short question to all the panelists and uh, we will go one by one. Uh, in order to really get the specificities uh, of each and every uh, areas of expertise, uh, starting uh, with Deputy Minister, uh, it would be uh, what would be, in your view, uh, the key features of pandemic preparedness, because that is really the topic, the, the topic uh, of the moment, and where to focus uh, investment. Uh, so, Deputy Minister, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Dear Ambassador, uh, dear uh, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, uh, I would like to speak a little bit about situation in the Czech Republic. And uh, finally, I will stress uh, the main areas of our uh, investments, ideas for the next year. So uh, let me uh, speak about just uh, two, three minutes uh, about the situation. So the ongoing global COVID-19 epidemic affected uh, in the Czech Republic throughout its territory. Uh, compared to other EU member states, the Czech Republic managed the first wave relatively well, thanks to 
timely restrictions which prevented the uncontrollable spread of the disease, but also placed an enormous burden for the Czech economy. However, the autumn wave hit the Czech Republic with considerable, considerable force. Uh, the unfavorable trend was initially seen in Prague, the most developed region of the Czech Republic. However, it gradually spread throughout the country. The Czech Republic currently represents one of the most affected countries in the world by the pandemic. Unfortunately, the pandemic gradually affected the health sector throughout the Czech Republic. In the light of COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare has emerged as one of the most important sectors of the economy and its modernization and development are also necessary in terms of financial sustainability, not only with regard to current real threats, but also with regard to future demographic developments. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the need to focus on promoting and protecting public health and to increase the resilience of the healthcare system. Healthcare must be prepared to respond flexibly to emerging threats such as COVID-19 or similar infectious diseases with pandemic potential. In addition to the professional and capacity readiness of the healthcare system, data and infrastructure readiness is, is essential. In the light of the COVID pandemic, the deficit of hospitals has emerged. This applies in particular to hospitals which in recent years have not had the opportunity to make significant development investments either from their own resources, national subsidies, or could not be supported by the European structural and investment funds. Following uh, the above, I already mentioned what is uh, important for Czech Republic. And so for the moment, the Ministry of Health has identified the main areas of support for critical points in the health sectors. The topics were chosen to support the most affected areas of health care. The aim is, on the one hand, to increase the resilience of health care providers who have to face the pandemic the most, those who form the backbone of hospitals in the Czech Republic. On the other hand, to better organize and adapt care for patients who are currently the most vulnerable as COVID-19 can be fatal for them. Furthermore, the need to support directly involved entities in solving threats is also perceived. The COVID-19 pandemic showed considerable unpreparedness in some areas of the Czech health system to respond to the following unexpected, unexpected threats. For this reason, basic priority investment areas were identified. Uh, firstly, modernization and strengthening the resilience of the backbone network of healthcare providers with regard to potential threats, development and modernization in uh, of workplaces in connection with the standardized network of emergency emergencies, ICU, Department of Anesthesiology, Resuscitation and Intensive Medicine, operating rooms, intervention and diagnostic workplaces. Secondly, development and enhancement of the resilience of care providers for particularly vulnerable patients, development of care for particularly vulnerable patients, cancer patients, obese patients, geriatric patients, and long-term sick patients, people with mental illness. Thirdly, increasing the readiness of entities involved in dealing with threats, development of significant laboratory capacities of health institutes and hospitals, development of infrastructure of regional hygienic stations, development of infectiolog infectiological workplaces of general hospitals. This main goal is to the main goal is to reduce the effects of the crisis and further modernize the entire system so that 
other potential threats no longer pose an immediate danger. So it is just from our side, uh, uh, our idea of what is important for the moment, and I am ready to discuss with you uh, and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Deputy Minister, for, for these remarks uh, and for highlighting uh, in particular the need for modernization uh, at the same time for keeping the accessibility and for taking care of the most vulnerable population. Um, now I will give the floor to uh, Felicitas Riedel uh, from the EIB uh, to also uh, share some, some remarks on uh, pandemic preparedness. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. I think uh, my predecessor already, or no predecessor, the previous speaker already gave a very good picture of what were the lessons learned and where the key focus is. I would like to um, maybe highlight a few different aspects that were only briefly touched upon from our point of view as EIB. For those of you who are not aware, last year in 2020, we signed loans uh, just uh, for health and life sciences of 5.2 billion, just to give you an order of magnitude. These investments ranged from supporting research and innovation in the development of novel drugs, vaccines, diagnostics and medical devices to healthcare infrastructure. Therefore, we have quite a holistic view of uh, the sector in general and also what has happened. Coming back to the question of pandemic preparedness, uh, from our point of view, what the pandemic has shown that, as already mentioned before, we have been faced with a situation of outdated healthcare delivery infrastructure, which is also re the result of a backlog of uh, necessary investments into the sector. A lot of the healthcare infrastructure has been 50 years or older without the necessary modernization that is required. It was probably not as flexible as it needed to be in order to be reactive. It also lacked digitalization, which is also something if we want to be ready for the next pandemic, this is a key area where investment should focus in. But also something that I would like to stress and highlight is the pandemic has also shown not only the dependence on India and China with access to essential goods, but also that and not only was there a shortage of uh, masks or personal protective equipment, but I think we shouldn't forget that we also had in some countries or in some uh, hospitals shortage of anesthesia or other essential drugs, meaning that in particular with the focus of Europe, there should be also a focus how can we either increase our own manufacturing capacities or how can we ensure access to essential medical goods. And with that, I'm not only talking about protective equipment, but also to the necessary drugs and infant vaccinations, which are also necessary. And then another key point uh, that I also think is worthwhile mentioning is we need to be prepared in terms of uh, our capacity to innovate and to react. So there are several pathogens that are known where there's currently zero potential products in the clinical pipeline. So what would the world look like if any of these would become pandemic? So how prepared are we in such cases? So there is an urgent need to revisit the situation and to be prepared in order to have something ready. I think we can be quite proud that it took less than a year or within a year we have had an approved vaccine on the market. I think this is uh, and has never happened in vaccine development that with such a speed, something safe has been brought to the market and that should also allow us to learn from this uh, going forward. I will stop here as otherwise I think we will have too many points mixing up and that we can focus the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicitas. Um, I will now uh, leave the floor uh, to uh, Professor Komarek um, to share his views um, on um, pandemic preparedness. Uh, Senor Ambassador, uh, muito obrigado for the invitation and uh, it's my honor and pleasure to participate on this excellent panel. Uh, we are really at uh, present in a very difficult time and uh, we need new vision, new strategies. 
Uh, of course, uh, vision without action is a daydream, and action without vision is nightmare. So uh, we really need vision and action, and uh, only that this way we can change the world. Um, I, I think that, uh, thank you for this question, that I think that uh, we need uh, to know more about uh, mutations, new mutations, about uh, COVID, and maybe we can focus uh, to, uh, just to improve uh, uh, our uh, microbiology laboratory facilities, uh, new state-of-the-art microbiology laboratory facilities with special attention to the molecular microbiology part. Uh, and uh, as about all, I suppose that should be uh, uh, along with robotic performance testing sequencing facilities uh, are needed to carry out molecular surveillance of uh, COVID uh, circulating variants. If you will be uh, familiar with the uh, uh, information about type of mutation, we can tailor, uh, tailor uh, management and therapy and approach uh, according to uh, this mutation, and we have a higher chance for early diagnosis, better, better therapy. So it's from uh, my view, this uh, uh, tendency should be one of the most important investment in uh, microbiologic molecular uh, laboratories. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, so indeed, uh, to be able to fight uh, the virus, we need to know more about it. So it's very important to focus on that. Uh, now, uh, I will uh, leave the floor to uh, Mr. Neves Martins for some remarks. Thank you. And first, uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the invitation and for this excellent conference uh, that I'm following since the beginning. And it's a pleasure to be in this panel, and I salute the colleagues, uh, particularly our moderator, Natalie Benigne, and our Deputy Minister. Just uh, some remarks. First, uh, a general one. Uh, health sector uh, is even more, after COVID-19, a key one uh, sector to our society and our economy. As we uh, clearly achieve with this pandemic, that changed our lives, but also changed the European Union and the world. Uh, I, I must uh, remember that the, the president of the Commission said uh, in his speech about the State of the Union that we must build the health European Union, and that is, in my uh, point of view, a very important decision that the COVID-19 experience gives to us all. And in my opinion, is the proper European political answer we have uh, for future and to prepare better, uh, not just the incoming days of this pandemic, but especially to prepare better our future. The lesson we can have is that we must work hard to achieve real conditions to prevent, to prepare answers and manage public health crises as COVID-19 one. We must, in fact, keep on going with the cooperation, the articulation, and new policies to be better prepared for the incoming years and for a future pandemic crisis with strategic investments and uh, developing innovation from the medicines to education and crossing industry, research, and distribution. In fact, uh, we can say all the health cluster needs to be uh, renewed, we need to reinvent the new ways of being, new ways of acting, new ways of uh, making cooperation. Of course, we have important measures by the European Commission, the European Center of Disease Prevention and Control, the European Medicines Agencies, but in fact, it was a kind of reaction to what we were living and we need to plan, we need to anticipate measures to have better uh, public health results, uh, better cost e efficiency, and better integrate European health. In a, more in a particular point of view, uh, we need to make some strategic investments, not just in these areas, but in a specific way, in leadership for the, the, the measures we need to have for vaccines, for therapeutics, antibodies and antivirals, 
personal protective equipment, testing, data and health, uh, medical equipments and devices, the industry and the distribution, the education and training that are very important also for our future, and reorganize the health systems and the modernization of the hospitals F, 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 as we are. In fact, we have done a lot as Europeans. We have done a lot, each of the countries, Portugal, the Czech Republic, and uh, the European population, uh, uh, in fact, own uh, to the health sector, health sector as overall, uh, the researchers, uh, the teachers, the scientists, the doctors, the nurses, and all the professionals own a lot. That makes me remember to finish. Uh, that uh, during this, uh, this crisis, during this pandemic, I, I, I remember a lot of times Winston Churchill uh, chasing the 20 August 1940 never was so much owned by so many to so few. And in fact, that's the best achievement we have today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Neves Martins for these remarks and indeed highlighting the need for cooperation uh, in the, well, in Within the, at the level of the EU and amongst countries. Uh, I will uh, now ask uh, Dosen Yiri Mali for his uh, view on, on the subject. Good afternoon, uh, the chairman, your colleagues. Um, I'm very honored that I have the uh, uh, ability to, to participate in this conference. Uh, I will maybe give you a little bit more focused picture uh, viewed from our hospital, from our department. Uh, it was already said that uh, I'm from ECAM originally, um, and we are focused more or less on cardiovascular and transplant medicine. So we were forced a year ago when this COVID uh, threat started, we were forced to deliver the care uh, to our patients uh, kind of um, in a different way that we were used to deliver the care. We completely shut down the hospital in uh, last March and April and maybe even part, part of the May. And uh, we had to start it to work hard on the, on the let's say, telehealth or telemedicine features. Uh, so, and it was completely new for us. Well, not completely, but it was new for us. And as you already definitely know, uh, it's very complex service to our patients. It's not just about the remote control or um, uh, storage of the data, but it's also about the real time interactive contact with our patients, which uh, definitely need a very, very sophisticated care. So I think uh, talking about the investment and visions and uh, let's say, uh, um, innovative things which can really improve the healthcare in the next few years. And I hope that COVID will be over sometimes, uh, hopefully. Um, but definitely there will be another epidemic uh, issue which will, which, will, which will threaten us uh, in, a, in, a, in a future. So I think we have to prepare ourselves, the hospitals, the general practitioners, and build up the very sufficient network through which can be delivered a very sufficient uh, type of care. So I think the, and it's it just our point of view in our hospital, so meaning cardiovascular medicine and let's say part of the transplant medicine, uh, we would really appreciate if um, it can be uh, in the near future, it can be delivered to the healthcare system, legislation and investment to the telemedicine, to build, building up the telemedicine networking and uh, this kind of uh, remote care for, for our patients. It will be very helpful because I think that uh, we will have to deal with, it, with this kind of problems in the near future again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mali, for, for these remarks. Indeed, I mean, there were challenges and uh, and now we have challenges in mastering these new ways of uh, delivering medicine and uh, i mean this is uh, one of the topic that we will definitely uh, focus on in the coming discussions now i will leave the floor to uh, mr dvorak um for some some remarks 
Hello, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I will try to be brief. Uh, I know we're running uh, a bit out of time. Uh, first, I will try to shift also the focus, you know, on the investment uh, after the COVID and uh, also the, during the crisis uh, to the perspective of uh, pharmaceutical industry, not just here locally, but also um, uh, from the perspective of uh, European Commission, European Union. Uh, and I believe uh, that it's all about the environment. Uh, currently, the Europe uh, exporting around 65% of global uh, medicine uh, in the value. So it's a quite significant, uh, quite significant uh, amount of, uh, of global share. And now the discussions which are running all around the Europe is, you know, how to become independent on the on the let's say other countries uh, out of the EU, especially during the crisis. And uh, I would like to warn it, you know, because it's it's something what uh, what can also harm, you know, the the way you know how the the logistic chain and also how the the production itself it's uh, facilitated globally, and especially you know from the Czech, uh, from the perspective of Czech Republic, we are we are fully dependent on the on the production out of the out of our country. Uh, we need to really think, you know, about the environment, how to attract the investment, how to try. Uh, to be, let's say, more in the focus of uh, pharmaceutical industry. And uh, it's not something what cannot be achieved. I mean, we are in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the region, in the CE region, one of the best countries uh, uh, attracting the investment to the clinical trials. Clinical trials are, let's say, uh, which comes you know, from the industry. It's on the yearly basis around the 2 billion Czech crown, which is quite significant to compare the, the other countries around. And we are quite unique, and I believe you know this is something you know what we have to also transform it to to other parts of R and D, uh, and and also try to think you know about the 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 environment adjustments to attract the production from the pharma industry, and it's not comes you know in a in a, in short time. It's definitely the long term uh, focus, but we have a very strong infrastructure here in the Czech Republic, especially in the area of. Uh, of uh, uh, centers of excellences uh, of the of the biotech research, and uh, I also believe you know that uh, that the support for transfer of technologies is something what can help uh, our small countries to uh, to survive you know in uh, after the pandemic and uh, after the crisis uh, how we see it uh, recently. So um, I will not take more time. Thanks for the invitation once again, and I'm looking forward. To Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tvorzacek. Uh, indeed, uh, strategic autonomy uh, and the possible disruption in uh, in the supply chain has been a big issue, and uh, and it's been, it will be very important uh, and a very important topic to discuss. Uh, now, um, I will uh, ask uh, Deputy uh, Minister um, a, a question, then a little bit more focused. Um, uh, it would be uh, in the context of uh, budgetary constraint. Uh, what organization of healthcare uh, would you see as the most appropriate to optimize the use of resources? And are the current approaches like developing ambulat uh, ambulatory care, etc., resisting the pandemic test? We have heard already that there is really a need for more flexibility, and uh, we would be uh, interested to to hear your view uh, on that. I, I also want to highlight that. Um, all the, the, the I mean, uh, everybody is um, uh, welcome to join, you know, the discussion. So once Deputy Minister will have answered, uh, you are very welcome to uh, add the remarks and, and to make some comments if you have. Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you for your question and I, I will try to answer them uh, very quickly or uh, my colleagues from Czech Republic can uh, uh, can uh, join uh, this debate, uh, but we can see several problems during this crisis. And the first is uh, the staff. It is not uh, about uh, the network of the hospitals. Uh, it's true that now we are facing a real uh, disaster in the hospital because we are on the top of the pandemic wave. But on the other hand, uh, our network is uh, rather uh, huge and uh, uh, it is not uh, the problem and uh, what is the problem is the staff. So uh, we are concentrated and I, uh, I suppose that we are, uh, we are satisfied in 
uh, uh, vaccination, firstly, the staff of the hospitals, and also in the future, we're supposed to concentrate on the stabilization of the doctors and the nurses, because uh, before the crisis, we identified that uh, many of the medical staff uh, were outside of the system, and now we are calling them to help uh, the hospitals. So, what we would, what we would like we need to stress is uh, is the stabilization of the medical staff uh, to have uh, uh, enough nurses for the new situation after the uh, pandemic, or or to be prepared for another another threat. Uh, also, before before this pandemic, we we planned to have uh, uh, to implement a, a reform of uh, uh, outpatient care. We we, we really uh, want to stress the position of GPs. Uh, we would like them to be more uh, efficient, more uh, to be uh, able to uh, overtake care of the patients uh, after the treatment in the hospitals to, to be more specialized, to, to share some equipment together in one uh, building, uh, um, a group of, of uh, GPs and so on. So uh, for the moment, I don't speak about investments because I mentioned this in my previous uh, statement and we really are ready to use React EU, and uh, we are happy that we have uh, this tool, and we are also ready to use uh, other tools for new investment. Uh, we, we concentrate in this field to have a, a network over the country. Uh, so we try to build uh, emergencies on the same level uh, throughout the country, and uh, this is also to do to react uh, to to get more uh, equipment for this network. But what is what is crucial is staff, and what is crucial is cooperation between hospitals and outpatient care. So for the moment, uh, if I can stop, and I am ready to. Answer other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister, for highlighting indeed the importance of, of staff um, because infrastructure without staff uh, cannot work and uh, the cooperation between the different levels, uh, outpatient and, and hospital. Um, would um, maybe some representative of uh, um, hospitals um, uh, be willing to, to also uh, address some comments here? Um, either uh, Professor Komarek or Professor Mali, for instance. If it's not the case, we can uh, go to, to the next question. So we will uh, we will move to to the next question. Uh, I will uh, I will um, ask the question to uh, Felicitas Rita, um, and I will revert to uh, the notion of uh, pandemic preparedness. Uh, so we are we are talking about pandemic preparedness, but uh, if we project ourselves, what do you see as the next pandemic? Because it might not be uh, actually um, coronavirus or uh, exactly the same one. Uh, and what do you see as the solutions uh, to to be developed to be prepared for for, for such a, a pandemic? Thank you very much. If you allow me previously, I would like to um, address some of the previous points that were addressed, just to stress that I uh, absolutely agree with them. I think uh, what was said before is the importance of primary health care in order to address the pandemic going forward. This is something that we fully support. And also the move towards e-health. Uh, telemedicine was already mentioned before. And in this context, I would also like to highlight that the way healthcare is delivered is in our views also changing. We have now um, more innovative uh, diagnostic tools as well. There can be a chip that is automatically measuring insulin levels or other important health indicators that could be transmitted directly to a physician in a hospital. 
uh, that can then adapt potentially the treatment uh, remotely so that there is no direct need of moving the patient inside the hospital, but a specialist advice could be given without making this movement, which would not only reduce costs, but also allow a more efficient approach going forward. Having said this, I would like to come back to the question about what could be the next pandemic. And um, there I would like to draw the attention to the increased antimicrobial resistance. I think this is something that probably most of you are fully aware of it, that this is a threat that we potentially are faced in a situation that by 2050, the existing antibiotics are not working the way we want, that simple operations will not be feasible anymore, and the leading cause of death might be infectious diseases, as uh, we don't know what to do. So in order to preempt the situation and to move fast, there is an absolute need to not only populate the pipeline with innovative drugs, but also try to see and address the current market failure, as at the moment we are faced with a situation that if there is a new antibiotic entering the market, it will be kept as a last resort. So therefore, the revenue potential that can be generated is probably not sufficient to give a sufficient return on investment, and thus there is no incentive really to invest as a private company into this market. This is something we are also looking into or have started uh, or launched already the AMR Action Fund that was together with the WHO, Wellcome Trust and also industry partners in order to be starting now today to prepare something in order to have solutions available going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Felicitas. Uh, that's uh, indeed, I mean, very interesting to, to understand better, um, you know, the incentives of the market and to be able to uh, answer it with the right tools. Uh, and, uh, and this is a, an extremely interesting initiative. Um, now, um, I will... Um, I have a question for Professor uh, Komare, unless uh, actually I'm happy to uh, open the floor uh, to, um, if, if you want to, to make a comment, uh, I leave the floor open for a couple of seconds. So I will, um, I, I will ask this question to Professor Komarek. Um, with regard also to, to what you were referring to in your uh, opening remarks. Um, uh, so, in, in the light of the experience of the pandemic, uh, then what type of infrastructure and equipment you see as missing in the country? Uh, and, and what, in your view, would be uh, this main priority instrument uh, to, to, to be developed? Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, uh, I have mentioned uh, some uh, important investment in uh, better diagnosis uh, and testing. Uh, so uh, to be early, uh, to be able to uh, make diagnosis as soon as possible and uh, to prevent uh, uh, spreading of, uh, of COVID. We also need uh, investment in uh, better uh, diagnosis of uh, post-COVID uh, problems, cardiac, uh, cardiac uh, brain uh, disorders after, after COVID uh, disorder. And uh, of course, uh, in the uh, future, uh, we will need uh, maybe uh, to follow up uh, long term, long time, long time uh, all patients after COVID because we can expect uh, Maybe as well as it was, it happened uh, 100 years ago after uh, Spain uh, in flu uh, that there were some uh, autoimmune uh, disorders, uh, Parkinsonic uh, problems, uh, and so on. So this is uh, also important investi investment in uh, this uh, in this uh, follow up. So. Maybe we uh, we are really not under and, and uh, we will be in the situation that the COVID and post-COVID problems will be with us uh, a long uh, long time and uh, so this is uh, some uh, very important 
investment. And also we have to invest to, to train people. Maybe I will uh, discuss it later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumaretz. Uh, indeed, I mean, uh, you, you already touched upon the importance of diagnostic and identifying uh, the, the different uh, variants. Uh, and and uh, thank you for raising indeed uh, the importance of uh, the long COVID and uh, and probably the strain that it will uh, put on uh, on um, the, the healthcare system. Um, if if you want to take the floor, um, I'm happy to to leave it to you. Um, if it's not the case, then um, I will uh, now um, ask a question to uh, Mr. Neves Martin. Uh, and here uh, I will uh, focus more on uh, what we touched upon in terms of um, a strategic autonomy. Um, as the pandemic has exposed uh, our dependency to foreign industries, uh, from masks to vaccines. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of discussions about building uh, EU strategic autonomy. Uh, so what are the investments to be made and, and also the trade-offs um, between uh, various options that can range from stockpiling to repatriation of production, depending on, on the product, the medicine? Um, so thank you. Thank you. In fact, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, reveals our vulnerability in uh, European health and um, show in a clear way uh, in the first months, essentially in the first months, our dependency to foreign industries. I've pointed in uh, my uh, initial remarks some areas that I believe are going to keep to be uh, gonna keep to be important in the incoming uh, months and incoming years, then allow me to give uh, more uh, uh, a global uh, answer to, to, to the question. Um, well, trying to complement what I have said before. And in my opinion, uh, we need as a European Union and each of us, the 27 uh, parts of his life, we must work um, to dedicate our capacity for emergency technologies, uh, for medical countermeasures, such as artificial intelligence and high performance computing, market intelligence, site uh, of serious cross border suites to health and public private ecosystems, as we need to identify better and address market and regulatory challenge and promote advanced research, innovation, and development of corresponding technologies uh, and countermeasures for anticipate uh, cross border threats of health, and then the stage research and develop clinical trials, as we heard before investigation, testing and validation, data infrastructure, each day more important, regulatory pathways, marketing authorization, industry and private sector part partnership engagement, that's a, a key issue for the incoming days, in my opinion, as we, we need to have more flexible and scalable manufacturing capacities as the European Union for the proper answer to relevant crisis as the one we are facing and living and try to have the best response to health emergencies with the European Union uh, industrial strategy that means autonomy, uh, growing autonomy. We, we need, in my opinion, to explore better the joint procurements, the direct contracts and advanced procurement agreements uh, while we don't have this uh, full autonomy or capacity as uh, a union to respond to another crisis and to don't be dependent as we have been in the first months of COVID-19 of foreign markets and seeing the prices rising up during the day and being obliged to make a direct uh, passage and pay 100% in advance. That's things that we can never forget in the, in the future, and we can never forget now that we are preparing 
uh, quite a new uh, European Union in the in the health sector as a cluster, as overall, not healthcare, but as overall, as we need to ensure capacity uh, to have uh, integrated stockpiles and distribution mechanisms better than the ones we had in March, April, and in the coming months last year. And uh, we need to include also the logistical infrastructures as storage and distribution and tailored emergency procurements and financial instruments here in developed partnership in agreements with, for instance, AEB that is, uh, allow me to salute, uh, it's making a, a great and outstanding work with um, with uh, the countries of our union and give, uh, giving a new, very good contribution to one of the problems that appears in uh, day by day, that's budgetary and, and funds to respond to all the, the situations. But we, we, we cannot forget, uh, the last but not the least, to improve capacities uh, with training programs to improve knowledge and skills. We cannot forget that one of the problems of this uh, pandemic was um, the situation of the human, the capital, human capital uh, in uh, so many, so many, so many parts, uh, not enough, or at least not enough to replace and to have the full uh, response uh, the countries needed and the European Union as a whole. Then we need also to think about the human capital to make uh, fellow partnerships and cooperation and articulation with the education, with the schools of medicine and other schools that are uh, giving us uh, the professionals to the future and uh, start to reinvent also approach uh, to he health and other situations. But that we can speak uh, a while uh, in the debate or in my last shot in the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Neves Martin. Um, indeed, I, um, you touched upon regulatory challenges, which is important, which which are important. Market authorization, more flexible manufacturing. Uh, but I also noted uh, the importance of uh, EU uh, cooperation, which resonates uh, with the EU presidency uh, of Portugal at the moment, and. Um, uh, this is indeed uh, a way uh, forward also uh, to have, I uh, won't say not more bargaining power, but at least maybe to be able to secure uh, the um, a supply chain. Um, would um, maybe someone want to react to, to, to one of these um, questions uh, or topic that were raised? Maybe I can just uh, have a short comment if you if you if you like, Natalie. Yes, uh, please, please, uh, Mr. Yeah, Dvořáček. We are in the in the in the stage when the Europe start to think about uh, the new pharmaceutical strategy uh, with the new role of uh, EMA, uh, also to create uh, a new agency uh, for let's say uh, uh, strategic issues in uh, in uh, pharmaceutical supplies and the care. And I believe, you know, it's something what usually the Czech Republic is not very, not very active. You know, this is the the certain this is the moment when we really need to start to think. You know, how the small countries like Czech Republic and Portugal could could somehow be involved. You know, in this development, this is the this is the chance. You know, to sh to somehow shape the environment uh, to have it uh, let's say more predictable, more predictable uh, flow of supplies to also reconsider. If the pharmaceuticals should be considered as a commodity, and to to think twice, you know how the how to create uh, the the Europa, uh, which uh, allows the the fair distribution of the of the pharmaceutical products in the time of crisis. And this exactly this is now exactly the time when all those things are start to to move, and uh, the Czech presidency is also close. Uh, the twenty twenty two is not far. And uh, those things needs to, to very definitely in uh, in line. So uh, I fully agree with uh, with my with my uh, I mean speakers who 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 had the chance to talk uh, before me, and uh, just to highlight it the time. It's uh, it's the moment. 
Thank you very much uh, for uh, for these comments and uh, indeed uh, highlighting the the importance of um, the current initiatives uh, in shaping the the new um, industrial um, strategy of of the EU. Um, no, no other comments on that. Maybe. Yes, please. Sure. Can I can I raise? I think it was great, great what uh, Mr. Dvořáček just said. And I have one more, one more question to either EU representative or um, EIB representatives. Uh, what is your, let's say, feeling, or how do you envision uh, the current cooperation between the Denmark, Austria, and Israel in creating a hub for 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 the new vaccine or for the vaccine? Um, uh, deliver to the to, directly to the EU. Um, so, uh, would um, Felicitas Riedel, uh, do, do you have a, a view on that, or alternatively, uh, Mr. Uh, Neves Martins? I think I can maybe start that, uh, generally speaking, as EIB, we are, of course, uh, very much in favor of a European approach so that the member states together provide solutions that are of benefit for everyone. Having said this, EIB is also very active in supporting projects that provide uh, solutions also for uh, mutations of the virus. I think that was also something that was already mentioned uh, previously that we all need to be aware of. We have now a set of vaccines. These set of vaccines are effective currently, but we already see limitations. Just the South African mutation is just one of them. And there appears to be amongst researchers consensus that it's highly likely that regular um, booster shots are necessary. And this is something also in terms of pandemic preparedness, where altogether we need to be prepared in order to build the capacities, the access to provide for uh, the general populations access to these uh, booster shots in order to ensure that once a key immunization has been achieved, that in particular the vulnerable population will receive the necessary update shots in order to maintain the protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicitas. Uh, Mr. Uh, yes, please, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank uh, you, you very much. <laughs> no, very, very briefly, very briefly, only two, two comments, two distinct comments. Uh, first of all, on this question that Professor Iji uh, Mali raised on the, the international cooperation on uh, vaccines, um, it is important to, to introduce uh, in our debate also uh, the following political dimension. Uh, it is very important that uh, uh, we keep the cohesion uh, within the European Union. We know that uh, it was uh, subject to a long debate in the context of the pandemic. Um, and uh, I think the achievements are there. Uh, the degree of coordination uh, amongst the European Union member nations and also in the context of the coordination from the European institutions is, uh, uh, is uh, a remarkable achievement. We should not put that in jeopardy, but at the same time, there is a, a political dimension involved. The governments need to attend the sheer need of their own populations, the constituencies, that uh, at the end of the day elect them and they are responsible in uh, in in front of their constituency so it is a very delicate balancing act and what we are witnessing uh, is really a product a result of the difficulties the challenges of the pandemic so we need to achieve the best possible operational result without putting in jeopardy coordination, cohesion inside the European Union, it is not always easy to achieve. Uh, we are 27 European Union member nations. The European institutions also play a very important role. 
we Portugal as uh, presidency of the European Union, or better said, of the Council of the European Union, we are trying to play the best possible role uh, in fostering coordination, uh, being aware that there are all these other uh, uh, implications that I just mentioned. I also know that here in the Czech Republic, the debate about international cooperation, vaccine vaccination, is also a very heated political one, and we need, obviously, uh, to be uh, extremely attentive to uh, the entire set of implications. Uh, let me uh, tell you that, uh, in our opinion, it is absolutely paramount that uh, the uh, European uh, 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 medical, uh, sorry, the uh, agency, the European uh, uh, agency responsible for the certification of the uh, vaccines uh, is uh, heard to the full extent of uh, uh, its capacities. For us, it is an obvious uh, conclusion of the debate that is taking uh, place uh, now. The other comment that I would like to make uh, has a lot to do with uh, uh, international and especially bilateral cooperation. And let uh, me take a couple of the points that were mentioned uh, both by Professor Komayek and by Dr. Carlos uh, Martins. Um, uh, when we look at the bilateral relations between Portugal and the Czech Republic, and I know that I am coming back to a point that I tried to make at the end of the first panel, there are a lot of uh, similarities, and some of those similarities don't work always in favor of deepening the bilateral cooperation. Take the example of our economies. Many of the sectors where we excel, we Portugal excel, innovation, artificial intelligence, computing, quantum computing, uh, nanotechnology, you name it, even from uh, space and the uh, aeronautical industry, you in the Czech Republic, you have exactly the same clusters, the same edge uh, uh, industries, that are very competitive with our own industries. Uh, and that is an impediment to a, a deeper uh, bilateral economic uh, uh, cooperation. What I am trying to say here in the Czech Republic, uh, addressing my Czech friends and interlocutors, is a very simple recipe. Let's join forces together, both Portugal and the Czech Republic, our clusters, our edge innovative companies and businesses, and let's try to create joint ventures that would uh, amplify the critical mass, and let's try to go together to uh, serve markets, not only inside the European Union, but also outside the European Union. Let's explore those opportunities, and let's try to do it together. I know that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Carlos Neves Martins knows very well what I am talking about, the opportunities of knowledge in Portugal, joining opportunities of knowledge in the Czech Republic, and trying thus uh, joining forces to, multiply, to, multiply, uh, to multiply and to amplify uh, that, uh, those synergies uh, and trying to create, uh, with that, opportunities for deepening bilateral bilateral cooperation. Thank you very much, Natalia, and I'm sorry for having been so long, but I think it is important that we also stress opportunities for bilateral cooperation. And I am sure that the EIB would be a very attentive uh, ear uh, if uh, both Portuguese and Czech companies address ourselves or themselves to the, I, to the EIB, asking for support, for uh, technical and uh, financial support to penetrate other markets. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, I mean, it was, it was also good to have uh, your view um, also as a representative of Portugal, um, who is uh, heading at the moment the, the Council of the European Union. Uh, and to highlight the fact that, yes, keeping the cohesion of uh, the EU is important uh, in the short term, of course, where there are some uh, political 
uh, also some political issues uh, that were related to maybe a, a bit of a lack of preparedness on, on some points. But in the long run, uh, definitely it's very important to think about it and to keep, to keep the cohesion going. And then uh, it's also very nice to see how um, Portugal and the Czech Republic, because we are also um, sharing, you know, uh, the perspective of the two countries uh, can find, you know, some synergies. So thank you for these remarks. Um, now, um, if there are no, no more uh, points uh, on uh, this topic, uh, I will give the floor to Professor Mali with, with a question um, that is still related to your main investment priorities. And I, I think you will have a, a bit more uh, an occasion to go a little bit deeper in, in what you think is important in terms of uh, e-health and, and other priorities. Uh, so um, uh, the question was, what are your main investment priorities and also to what extent uh, have they been impacted by the pandemic? Uh, and what types of adjustment that you were uh, mentioning uh, e-health notably uh, do you see necessary to, to address the current trend, so aging populations notably, uh, as well as the increased risk of pandemic? Uh, Professor Mali, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 thank you. So I was just asking. Uh, the, the question was, the question was. Yeah, the the, the question was uh, uh, still about your your main investment priorities, um, and uh, and in particular, if you want to elaborate on on the e health uh, topic, um, that um, so, and yeah. to what extent you know, uh, because we we have two trends. I mean, we have the long term trend that was aging population, and that has its own requirement. And at the same time, we have this increased risk of pandemic. Uh, and the two are colliding a little bit, uh, and uh, and the, 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 there is also a question here on uh, how you see, you know, the um, um, the, the development of um, the infrastructure and in general the healthcare in that context. Yeah, I, I think I already I was already mentioning at the beginning of this panel that for us the the the, the, the crucial thing, the main thing was how to deliver the healthcare to patients during the pandemic. And of course, it's very obvious that the only way uh, how to deliver is to have a good network. And you mentioned it, good network in, I call it, let's say, telemedicine or e-health or however you will call it. And we just found that it's very hard, especially to certain regions. And I think we will have the same trouble, same problem, uh, for example, as Portugal that in certain regions, the infrastructure uh, to deliver the healthcare through, and I would be very, let's say, um, open through the uh, IT networking or IT infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure, it's sometimes very hard. Because for example, the, uh, the equipment of normal general practitioner of primary healthcare here in certain regions, it's not sufficient enough uh, for us to be able to deliver uh, the, 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 let's say, quality patient care. So I would be really very, very, let's say, I would highlight the fact that creating the infrastructure uh, for delivering the, the, the e-health care or the telemedicine health care or the health care through the telemedicine, it, it's going to be, I think, the major investment for, for, for the government. And, but I think it's necessary because, as I think uh, uh, the, the, the people who are speaking uh, um, during this panel already mentioned, that uh, we can be again, or some another pandemic can threat us in the near future again. And I think Prof Professor Komarek mentioned the fact that there can be some autoimmune disorders which will follow this viral threat. And we have to be prepared on this. And I think creating the sufficient infra infrastructure for the future to be able to deliver this uh, healthcare, distance healthcare, would be one of the major investment in to the infrastructure for the government. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mali, for um, providing a bit more detail on uh, on the importance of um, telemedicine and, and to what extent it it will be like. Um, crucial 
uh, tool for the future. Um, I will, um, if, if someone wants to, again, I open the floor. If um, anyone wants to raise a comment, you are welcome. Otherwise, I think if I, I can complement yes, please. what was said, I think it's also equally important to also look into the electronic health record, which I think could also be a prerequisite uh, for what was uh, discussed by Mr. Mali. Also, if you look at the transplant, which is, I think, uh, also one of your core areas, if we follow the example of Estonia, where I think the entire population has an electronic health record, where also with one click, you can say, would you be willing, for example, or if you say nothing, it's automatically assumed you're willing to be an organ, uh, to allow your organs to be transplanted or not. So you can make a click or not a click. So automatically you have a better overview. You also create cost efficiencies by having access to various x-rays. Um, you also have a better control with um, e-prescriptions. I think this is also something where a lot of abuse is being done. So what we see from ERB point of view is that in the infrastructure projects that we do support, there is a growing percentage of um, ICT or IT components in it in order to prepare. Well, I think many people, um, probably this panel, yes, uh, but outside, many people are not aware of is that even in one country, so in one region, different hospitals don't even use the same software. So it's even difficult to have a communication amongst different hospitals, let alone um, integrate their electronic health record. And that's also something from political level. And I know that the EU is also supporting in this area to provide guidance on how this can be done. But this is something that I would also see as a, something, an important step going forward and also allowing Europe to be better prepared should there be another pandemic coming to just have the infrastructure and make an exchange of data much easier in order to be able to react faster. Thank you uh, very much, Felicitas, for um, highlighting the second, um, uh, second angle. Uh, of ELs, which is, I mean, telemedicine, but also electronic health record. Um, this also uh, can lead to also the importance of data and, and uh, to what extent uh, having also a records uh, of um, and, and uh, health data uh, can also support innovation, maybe, or um, the development of. Um, new medicine or uh, to identify maybe some correlation, some patterns. Um, I don't know if it's uh, something that can also um, be considered. So um, now if there are no other comments on the field of EL, I will uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Dvoracek. Um, I have the question um, that is, um, um, so again, uh, on, um, on the strategic autonomy and how can the pharmaceutical industry contribute to EU strategic autonomy and what in your view uh, what is in your view uh, uh, the case regarding the design of the supply chain and the location of production capacity? Wow, it's a quite a difficult question, <laughs> and 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 huge. You know, uh, first of all, you know the industry is not uh, good or bad. The good industry goes, you know, to the environment which is open and which is created, you know. To, uh, towards the, the need of the industry. So if the Europe and especially the small countries wants to play the, the role, you know, in the production and uh, uh, let's say also in the distribution of pharmaceuticals, they need to definitely change the current environment. If you take, you know, how long does it take, you know, to get, uh, to get the permission to start to, uh, to launch, for example, new production line in the Europe compared to, uh, to other parts of the world, it takes uh, uh, really much longer than uh, the number of uh, uh, countries you know, which we compete with. And this is the one part. And uh, also the very important is mentioned that, uh, that uh, 
the production, uh, the producers, the marketing authorization holders only influence a certain part of the, the logistic chain. And uh, it's on each and every country in the Europe, how they, let's say, work with the supplies, which are produced for individual countries. Uh, let's say the common, common logistic, uh, uh, the way is that the, after the, after the, the, the production is, 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 is done, and uh, we uh, sell the, the pharmaceutical product to the distributor, then uh, we have really limited uh, chance as producers, you know, to ensure that the, the goods, uh, pharmaceuticals, which are, which are prepared for certain country, really finish, you know, in the full capacity in the, in the destination. This is the one. And we also, as, uh, as I mentioned it before, you know, we are in the, in the, in the European Union space, where we have free movement of goods and the pharmaceuticals are considered to be the commodity. So uh, uh, there, is a, there is a very limited uh, chance for the producers to ensure that, uh, as I said, you know, the production done for a certain country finish, you know, in the country. And uh, all, the, all, the, all those important things are, again, you know, about the data as, uh, as in the e uh, also in the production and supply we really uh, uh, are in the need of uh, quality data to know, you know, how the, the production uh, uh, is dedicated for uh, the certain uh, each and every European country, uh, how the production flows, uh, where the supplies uh, are, and if, uh, if uh, we could uh, ensure, you know, what we sign for, and uh, it's the availability of pharmaceuticals for dedicated patients. And it was clearly shown, I know, at the, at the last spring, that uh, very little disruption of the chain can cause uh, extreme damage. Uh, you know, just the just the, the limited uh, limited uh, checkups on the on the borders created the lines, you know, with supplies and especially the pharmaceuticals and the which are at the, at the need of cold chain. Uh, it creates the, the big mess around the around the Europe's flow of supplies. So. Uh, this is something what we definitely have to learn from and uh, to come with, let's say, the new idea, how we will, this strategic commodity, which I, I, I believe, you know, the pharmaceuticals are the strategic commodity, how we will uh, work with it, how we will ensure, you know, that every patient in the Europe has the, the pharmaceuticals which were created for him or for her, in majority on the regulators, and uh, how they will set up the future, 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 let's say, environment for pharmaceuticals. So uh, we are ready to play the role. We would like to, you know, continue in the high level forum, which was uh, set up at the at the spring 2020. Uh, but it's mainly on the on the on the EMA and the and the national states. You know how they will again. I'm coming back again. You know to the new pharmaceutical strategy. This will set up the environment for coming uh, 15 years. And we have to be very uh, in detail of we are, what we are solving. Because even if we will do too much regulation, we will kill the, the, the production and uh, it will be, the, it will be not attractive for the, for the industry. If we will, if we will uh, resign to, to control the flow of uh, pharmaceuticals in the Europe, then we will have a, uh, again and again the problems with supplies you know, in the countries where the prices were low. So, uh, and especially if you take uh, the countries like Czech Republic, we are constantly, uh, uh, we have a constant problem with the import uh, incentives which were created by Germany, uh, but the price is um, uh, much higher than here. And, uh, you know, the countries like Czech Republic, Slovak and many others, they play the role of suppliers for, uh, for other countries without the control of the producer. So this is all the questions which we need to answer. And we have uh, now is the time because uh, uh, all those topics are now raised uh, by the Commission to to have the opinion of all national countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Dvorak, for these uh, enlightening comments. I would say, I mean, bringing not, <laughs> bringing some light on uh, on very topical issues, and uh, indeed. Um, and there is a, this new pharmaceutical uh, strategy being designed at the moment, and uh, it's definitely the right time to uh, consider um, all these uh, supply chain uh, issues and and also the to ensure that uh, each and every country uh, is served uh, as per uh, their needs. Um, um, 
would um, would one of the, the panelists uh, be willing to comment on uh, on this? Thank you. So um, it's not the case. So I, I will um, uh, now uh, revert to uh, Professor Komarek. Uh, with a, a, a new question, and um, and this time we will touch uh, more upon um, the training, um, because so you you are the dean of the second faculty of medicine of Prague, uh, and uh, the pandemic has reminded us of the crucial importance of well-trained uh, human resources to address uh, this crisis. Uh, so, as dean of the medical faculty, what do you see as major investments to be made in training resources? and to make the medical staff ready to fight pandemic situations. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are really very happy and proud that uh, more than 1,000 Czech students uh, were helping uh, last year in uh, hospitals. Nevertheless, uh, as a volunteers, nevertheless, uh, their uh, qualifications is uh, not enough to uh, to to work, for example, in intensive unit, uh, and uh, na, they are no familiar with cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So we need really not only in our hospital in Mortal and our faculty, but also in other uh, faculties, uh, excellent cardiopulmonary resuscitation simulation center for medical staff, physician, nurses, and of course students about all simulation of uh, life-saving techniques and manners, including diagnosis of uh, vital sites and uh, intubation and so on and so on. So we hope that uh, also this uh, better uh, experience with the uh, COVID pandemic uh, can help us uh, to improve uh, this, uh, 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 this problem and uh, to uh, to train uh, physician and uh, students uh, to be more uh, uh, ready and more qualified for uh, helping uh, during new pandemic or new ways of this pandemic. So I hope that uh, I, I think that this investment is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, indeed, uh, I mean, there are also opportunities in, in the pandemic uh, in the sense that we really realize uh, that it's also important to have maybe a bit more flexibility on, on the staff uh, and having some uh, proper uh, adequate training so that they can uh, also be allocated to some crisis um, situation uh, is indeed useful. Um, would uh, one of the panelists uh, be willing to 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 comment on uh, on this topic? May I? Sure, uh, with pleasure. Just two points. Uh, well, uh, the last three uh, remarks um, were very important, but I got to start to say that in fact uh, we are quite finishing our our fantastic panel. In fact, we, um, Portugal and the Czech Republic, we have a great opportunity in the health cluster for what I heard, uh, strategies, uh, well, also some problems that we have. And it's um, a great opportunity, as uh, our ambassador um, remarked, in the, in the bilateral cooperation in research, in development, and also in business. Uh, we can do business with uh, joining our our experience, uh, our uh, capacity, and we can open new markets to each country, and we can learn together also on that on that area. In the in the we have good experience. I I heard the professors say uh, speaking about simulation, e health, and new ways of 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 uh, teaching. Uh, I am the pleasure to be involved in the, the technological center of the Lisbon School of Medicine where we have a simulation center, where we have a, a, a experimental surgery center. And with the COVID, we just closed the door of a fantastic fourth uh, floor building. And we start to make online a masterclass course, uh, courses, uh, emergency, cardiovascular emergencies, trauma, leadership in operating theater. And that's, and we are cooperating with some schools of medicine in Europe. And that's a good opportun opportunity also to uh, to to enlarge our our cooperation and open uh, new fields, uh, learning 
um, together. Also in the industry area, we have a very strong, small as a country, but a very strong Portuguese industry, and we have developed database, and we have developed, developed uh, quite uh, interesting uh, technologies, and uh, that can be also a link between the two countries and profiting our presidency, actual presidency, and yours that becomes uh, in two years' time. Then, uh, just to, to stress that, from my experience, uh, not just in government, but last year as uh, chairman of the biggest uh, university hospital in Portugal, likely as a senior advisor around the world, and uh, knowing the capacity of my country, a little bit of yours, because Mr. Ambassador also is enthusiastic about, about Czech Republic and, uh, and uh, enlightened me uh, a lot about it. I believe, in fact, we have in the pharma area, in the education area, and even in in e-health area, we can join some efforts and reach uh, good solutions together. Thank you Thank very you. much, Mr. Martins. I appreciate it very much. Uh, there is just, um, I, I'm not absolutely sure of um, how long we can continue, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I, I think, I think that we don't have uh, we don't have too much time uh, left uh, also for technical reasons the time that was foreseen the time frame for our conference uh, if uh, there is uh, uh, no one else to take the floor uh, to make a comment or to uh, make uh, a final just, yeah, yeah. That, that there was just one maybe more point where we can yes. open the floor to yes. uh, anybody that would want to 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 make a comment then we will not direct the question uh, but it's uh, it's more on innovation uh, we have touched upon it uh, a little bit with the incentives uh, for instance to produce um, uh, antibiotics um, but um, um, what uh, are the main obstacles and and what should be um, what, what should be developed uh, in order to um, strengthen uh, the innovation? Uh, in the EU, uh, and also uh, in terms uh, of uh, t transfer, uh, technology transfer, you know, from uh, the universities uh, and the medical uh, research center uh, to the industry. Um, I, I leave the floor open to um, uh, the panelists. Maybe you finish with us. Yeah, I was just going to say if nobody says then um, I can say from our point of view what we see that it's highly important that that Europe is getting better in exploiting all the results from the research that is generated at its universities and research organizations. I think we see the example from the US, Canada or Singapore who are excellent in exploiting this type of research. And what we see is that there are key components that are necessary. One is access to finance, so that they are alongside um, the value chain of development that you can ensure to have sufficient capital capital available along the sites and there I think EIB also stepped up massively with its venture debt program to particular support the early stage companies in their growth phases where we saw that there was a huge shortage in Europe in comparison to other geographies but also what is important is to have um, access to entrepreneurs or to people willing to take the rest uh, the risk and that have the capacity to provide um, the necessary skill sets to move a company alongside the various stages so it's a different skill set that is required if you manage a five people company or if it always all of a sudden becomes a quoted company and is uh, developing further and this is also something where we see huge potential i think europe is also building this expertise and uh, putting all the efforts together, I think we can be even stronger to ensure that the excellent ideas, which we see are equal to those of the US in terms of publication. If you use this as an indicator, I think there we're definitely not lacking behind. 
but in terms of a significant market capitalization of our tech companies, there's still room for improvement. And as ERB, we are trying to foster this process along the value chain. Thank you very much uh, for um, spotting, I mean, the, the domain needs um, that are not really on the, the research side because we, we are already uh, doing well, but uh, but really uh, to uh, to f yeah may make uh, uh, well uh, make the technology uh, uh, grow in the in the industry. Um, are there some maybe other remarks from from some other panelists on this topic? I have not been a panelist, but can I make a very short intervention? With pleasure, with pleasure, Mr. Matic. Thank you. Just one minute. I think that there was a, a lot of focus in the second panel on investment uh, into frontline services, ensuring sufficient diagnostics, uh, research, uh, hospital capacities, uh, access to medicines, and so on. We should not forget that one of the areas that really underperformed, certainly in Czech Republic, but in some other places as well, is the core public health infrastructure. And uh, it's a result of a, of a long-term neglect uh, in uh, essential public health services. Those are the epidemiological sanitary services in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, in Czech Republic, for example, it started about 10 or more years ago. Uh, investments and expenditure were cut by 50% and the staff was cut by 50%. So the pandemic did take the country by surprise with insufficient, uh, insufficient capacity for diagnostics, uh, data collection and analysis, surveillance, uh, contact tracing, uh, and other core functions that, that cannot be avoided uh, in case of any future emergency of any kind, whether it's an infectious disease, uh, um, uh, emergency, or any other kind of public health emergency. So I think this this issue deserves uh, particular uh, attention and special discussion and should not be forgotten in making the list of priorities for investment. This is a massive long-term investment. It will take years to to put it, to bring it back to the necessary capacity. And sh it should stay on the map because otherwise we will be surprised by whatever comes next, whenever it comes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matic. Um, indeed, uh, this has been a bit forgotten. Uh, there, there was something a little bit uh, later. <laughs> we didn't have time, unfortunately, uh, to touch upon uh, that point. Uh, but we have indeed seen how crucial uh, this was in, in the time of this pandemic. If there is a, a, a comment on, on this particular topic, then otherwise I will probably do some uh, short closing remarks. No. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, all our distinguished speakers for this uh, very in interesting and and I have to say also interactive uh, panel uh, which uh, I think brought a, a lot of ideas and uh, some important trends that I, I have seen uh, it's notably on uh, the role of uh, the EU and the, the importance of coordination uh, between the countries, uh, the importance of regulation as well, and notably uh, this uh, new pharmaceutical strategy that has come uh, several times uh, in um, in the discussion to provide uh, uh, tools for control, but also incentives uh, for, for the production. Uh, the importance also keyword of flexibility, flexibility uh, of the hospitals, uh, flexibility of the staff, uh, possibility uh, to use uh, telemedicine and and other uh, types of um, of uh, mechanism and device uh, to uh, allow, uh, to 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 make sure that we reach everybody. Uh, that is also uh, important. Means also the importance of accessibility uh, of the healthcare uh, system. Uh, and of course, uh, all the questions about uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, that uh, that that we have discussed. 
so I think um, these were uh, extremely uh, fruitful discussions. Uh, and I will now uh, leave the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Ambassador for uh, his closing remarks. Thank you very much to all. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, first and foremost, or first of all, to you for uh, having conducted the moderation of this uh, very important last panel of our, uh, of our remarkably impressive uh, conference. I think that uh, the three segments of our conference covered a lot of ground. Uh, we are going, as I said at a certain point, uh, uh, we are going to collect the main takeaways, the summary of the key aspects that were highlighted throughout these many hours of discussion and presentations, and we are going to submit them in advance to all the participants in order for them to have the opportunity to review them or to add even a couple of slides or thoughts that they had not had that they, they did not have the opportunity to, to refer to or to mention during uh, our, our debate. So thank you very much to the Deputy Minister of Health of the uh, Czech Republic. Thank you very much to Felicitas Riedel uh, from the European Investment Bank. Thank you very much to my old friend, Carlos Martins. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Irgi Mali. Uh, thank you very much to uh, to uh, Jakub uh, Dvorasek uh, uh, and also to Professor Vladimir Tomarek. It's always a pleasure to see you again and to have the opportunity to exchange uh, views with you. Uh, I am not going to sum up the entire conference. I think that we followed with great attention our debate. Let me uh, finalize by mentioning uh, something that is very practical, but very important. And again, that could be useful in the context of the uh, reinforcing bilateral relations between Portugal and the Czech Republic. You know that uh, Portugal some weeks ago was in, uh, again, in dire straits in what the epidemiologic situation uh, was concerned. We were uh, really facing uh, a wave of uh, many new cases uh, of uh, contagion. Uh, we were faced with uh, challenges coming from uh, the uh, different forms that the pandemic uh, is assuming, uh, and uh, the Portuguese authorities had to take very strict, very stringent uh, confinement uh, quarantine uh, measures that are always uh, painful, but they are producing results. And my message, uh, my optimistic uh, uh, message to my uh, Czech uh, friends and colleagues and the uh, general uh, public opinion and the general Czech public is that those measures are unavoidable at producing results. We witness now uh, an overall trend in new cases showing a sharp decrease uh, since uh, uh, the beginning of uh, the, the measures where the recent measures were taken. The effective reproduction number, the famous RT, stands below one uh, and is now one of the lowest in Europe, confirming the decreasing trend of infections. Uh, on the 8th of March, so as recently as the beginning of this week, Portugal is now uh, the fifth lowest rate in the European Union in uh, what new cases uh, uh, is concerned. So it is a remarkable decrease that is really lifting the extreme pressure on our national health services, especially in, in what uh, new hospitalizations and uh, cases in uh, ICUs are concerned. So, uh, again, uh, a good example uh, that we need to reflect upon. Uh, of course, we are not off the hook. As it was very clearly stated during the conference, the light at the end of the, of the tunnel is very much dependent on the success of the vaccination campaigns, the different national vaccination campaigns and their long-term uh, 
long-term results. But it is also very important to keep in mind that we need to release the pressure on our health services. And the only way to do that, and the only way also to achieve a decrease in the overall trend in new cases is to take measures that are appropriate, that are different from country to country, but I hope that the example of the recent success in Portugal could be of some use to our uh, Czech uh, friends in order for them to assess the effectiveness of strict uh, measures. So, with that positive note in what Portugal is concerned, bearing in mind that the overall epidemiologic situation in the Czech Republic is uh, very complex, very complicated. Uh, we are not yet uh, looking at a better perspective in what uh, uh, the new cases uh, is uh, concerned. Uh, but again, uh, nobody is isolated, especially in what the European Union context is concerned. And also, uh, nobody, as Maria de Belen Rosaya said, nobody will be left behind. So thank you very much. This final panel was very much prospective, looking into the future, but also already in the making, because investments and innovation, especially in the health sector, cannot wait. So thank you very much. And looking forward to see all of you again. The next conference of our cycle of conferences will take place exactly one week from today, and it will deal with a very different set of subject matters. We are going to discuss the transatlantic relationship after the new administration in the United States took hold after the recent elections. We are going to discuss NATO-European Union relations, the deepening of the Europe of defense, and we are also going to discuss the very complex issues related to the relationship with China and Russia. So thank you very much. I uh, would like also that you could uh, find the time to uh, connect yourselves uh, to our next conference in uh, one week's uh, time. So stay safe and uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, please, COVID-free optimism looking at the results of the vaccination campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you, obrigado. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.